The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Friday, October 7, 2022, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network on the campus of Texas Southern University. Folks, we are less than 35 days from the November midterm elections. Huge implications as to who controls not only the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House, but also crucial state races, gubernatorial races, state house, state senate, local races, all of that. We are talking election today here in Texas. We were in Georgia on yesterday. We'll be chatting with a number of folks who are on the ballot, individuals who understand the importance of voting. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, we're talking to officials here uh, on campus, talking about what my students are talking about. Also, we'll be hearing from the co-founders of Black Voters Matter as well. We're partnering with them on this broadcast from TSU. And so lots to cover, folks, uh, on when it comes to elections. And so we'll do all of that right here. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah, it's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah, it's rolling, Martin. Yeah. All right, folks, it is good to be back home in Texas. My high school, Jack Yates, right across the street on the campus of Texas Southern University in the Barbara jo Jordan Mickey Leland uh, School here. Of course, two distinguished graduates, both former members uh, of Congress. Uh, one of them, the first black woman elected to Congress since Reconstruction. Uh, yesterday, we were in Georgia, in Swainsboro, Georgia, uh, for an event there with the uh, Raphael Center, Work Raphael Warnock campaign, talking to folks there about uh, what matters, what's important, what do they care about. And so we'll be doing the exact same thing here. Uh, there are a number of people going to be coming through, candidates uh, who are running for office. Uh, we're we'll talking to Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, Y'all let me know Congressman Al Green is going to be here, my alpha brother. Uh, so the number of people are going to be chatting with students also be here as well. And we can't wait to get their take on what they care about uh, during this election. 
it really is an important one. Uh, we cannot understate how cr critical this is. Now, you watching, you probably will say, well, we always hear that. People always talk about how every election is the most important thing. Well, that's not a lie. Every election is important. Because what it speaks to in terms of where we are going as a country, who do we want in charge? Over the last two years, we have experienced the election deniers who are running for office on the Republican side. Some of them, a number of them, are actually leading in the races. They don't believe the 2020 election was fair. They literally are trying to rewrite laws, have rewritten laws in this particular state. You have some of, had some of the most onerous voter suppression take place. It was already a hard state to vote. Now it's made even harder. We're in Harris County, where Houston is located, and Republicans have been targeting this state specifically. Why? Because they have not liked the fact that Democrats have been elected in Harris County. And so what they have done is target this county as much as they can when it came to voting. You might remember they had drive-through voting in the 2020 election. They went to court, they changed the law, and they actually outlawed that for some reason, which makes no sense whatsoever. And so Republicans understand, and this is not just in Texas, it's all around the country. When you expand the electorate, when you create more opportunities for people to vote than Republicans who are unwilling to fight for those voters or present their ideas, they try to stop that because Democrats win when more people vote, when you expand access to the ballot. That's why they've been fighting drop ballot, uh, ballot drop boxes. They've been fighting mail-in ballot, balloting, even in states where historically they've had no issues with mail-in balloting. You've heard them lie about vo voter fraud. You've heard them make things up when it comes to that, all in an effort for them to change the laws in order to make it easier for them to win. Of course, you sitting at home will say, and there are some people we know, when I see them on social media, they say, well, this is really no big deal because, you know what, I don't think that voting matters. Well, this is very simple. If your vote did not matter, if voting was irrelevant, then why would Republicans be so aggressive in trying to prevent folks from voting? It's a really basic question. And so uh, for the next couple of hours, we're going to talk about what's happening with the election, talk about issues, uh, and also what's on the mind of voters. I want to talk right now to Dr. James Douglas, a distinguished professor of law at the TSU Thurgood Marshall School of Law. Uh, he uh, has been uh, very much, he's seen a lot of this sort of stuff. You've seen the legal challenges uh, in this uh, state as well. Doc, glad to see you, uh, my alpha brother. Here's the thing that uh, is so important. We just saw this week uh, uh, on uh, Monday, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, uh, how she came out firing, laying out the, the importance of the 14th Amendment and that and made it clear she didn't run from the issue of race. She's made it clear to them. No, the 14th Amendment was specifically about race. It wasn't race neutral. Uh, we've seen and that's a voting issue. They were dealing with the addition of a second congressional district uh, in Alabama. Uh, they've stopped the addition of additional one in Louisiana. Black population significant in those two states. They should be having a second congressional district. Unfortunately, they are not. Just your thoughts when you on the legal battles, because this is really where the war is being waged in courtrooms across America. You're right, Roland. And this is why it's important to vote, because when you were in high school, you learned that there were three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. They didn't tell you that the judiciary branch is more powerful than any of the others. The Supreme Court rules the country because the Supreme Court can decide whether what the president does is legal, a uh, statute that the Congress passed is legal. And who decides who's on the Supreme Court? The president and the Senate. Well, well and that, that's the U.S. Supreme Court, but you still have the important role of the state Supreme Court. Yeah, the, you, and here in Texas, we vote for them. So if you don't vote, you literally are not voting for the very people who are deciding cases. I know, but remember, the U.S. Supreme Court can tell the Texas Supreme Court that they're wrong. Right. Uh, no uh, one can tell the U.S. Right. Supreme Court that right. they're uh, wrong. Uh, on some things. But, 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 but what, I'm, what I try to get our people to understand is we have to think of this thing much broader. 
So we see the rulings coming out of Pennsylvania from their state Supreme Court. Yes. We see the rulings in Wisconsin. Republicans control that because of gerrymandering, where they outlawed ballot drop boxes, state Supreme Court. Well, the North Carolina State Supreme Court, when Democrats got back control of that, they ruled racial gerrymandering to be illegal. And so here in Texas and other places, I'm trying to get people to understand that you might vote up top, but if you don't go down and if you ignore the, the, those state, those state uh, judges, they are actually making rulings that have an adverse impact on black folks every day. They're making rulings, but also remember the state legislature determine who goes to Washington. Right. And, and so... When it comes to um, uh, drawing the district lines to decide which voters vote for whom, it's the state legislators right. that do this. So you're right. Local politics is extremely important. All voting is important because all voting affects our everyday life. Mm -hmm. And people who don't vote then shouldn't be complaining about what happens with their everyday life. That's why it's important for everybody to go out and vote. Because if you don't vote and make your voice heard, then the other people, and I'm talking about the white people, especially the white races, they're going out and putting people in right. office that will do what they said. One of the things Donald Trump did was he told his constituents when he was running, these are the people I'm going to put on the Supreme Court, and this is what they're going to do. And they're doing what he said they were going to do. Well, here's the thing that that that, that jumps out at me. Again, I talk about the, the legal battles uh, that that, that I get going on, uh, and, and that is uh, when you look at attorneys like Mark Elias, when you look at um, when you look at um, uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, laws committed for civil rights under law. I mean, you know, they are literally uh, in in a war every single day in these courtrooms uh, come, battling these crazy legal theories of these conservatives who are trying to do everything they can uh, to minimize the impact of black Latino voters. Oh, that's, that's true. And, but, but remember, you can make the best legal arguments in the world because the Supreme Court and these other courts say, at the end of the day, we make the decision. It has nothing to do with whether or not the argument you make is the most logical argument. We make the decision. And so we have to make sure that we put the right people on the court so that those people are making decisions that keep us a part of the process rather than remove us from the process. Have you seen um, an uptick, if you will, of students who are interested uh, in civil rights law? Yes. Yes. But the problem is they don't really understand it. What do They're you mean? interested but they don't really understand it because they don't understand the history behind it all. See, we have allowed other people to teach our kids the wrong history, which is why the Republicans are fighting so hard to make sure that critical race theory is not taught because they don't want our kids to know what effect government has had on them. Right. I teach a civil rights course. And, and I try to teach my students, look, we had all kind of discrimination, but we talk about the role that the court played in discrimination, the role that the court played in segregation, the role that the court played in slavery. So we, we don't, they don't teach you that in high school. Right. But, 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 you, but you said that uh, they don't know it. So the question is, again, uh, what is the emphasis here at an HBCU, at TSU? Those students are coming through because I've talked to others who said that uh, in the in, in because of Black Lives Matter, because of Black Voters Matter, because of all the momentum we've seen over the past decade, there's been a resurgence, if you will, not only in students going to HBCUs, but also interested in civil rights law. Oh, I agree. And that's why I say that's why the right wing does not want our students and our young people to know. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they know the impact that the right wing and the right wing government has on our communities. So, yes, we have a lot more young people now who are interested in politics, who are interested in voting and understand the importance of voting.
Absolutely. Well, Dr. Douglas, always good to see you. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Uh, and again, uh, it's a lot of, I keep telling people when you don't know, you don't know. And so that's why well, we use the media apparatus to also teach folks and train them. I want to remember this. Three. Barbara George, Mickey Leland, Craig Washington. All graduates of Texas Southern University. All eight representatives of the 18th Congressional District. All right. We well, appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. All right, folks, uh, we're going to bring in a couple of more guests right now uh, to, to, to talk about in terms of, again, what is at stake and what's going on in terms of, in terms of, in terms of what we're doing here. Uh, and again, folks, um, I know some of you may be saying, in all oh my goodness, you know, we hear all vote, 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 vote. But we're trying to walk people through and explain to them exactly uh, what it means and, and, and what they should be doing uh, and things along those lines. And so uh, Damian Walker, what's Damian Walker? Uh, so, Damian Walker, step on up, please. Uh, and Lori. Okay, all right. Cool. Come on, Damian, come on. All right, take a seat. How you doing, sir? All good, all good. All right, Damian, how you doing? Doing well. Doing well yourself? Uh, doing great. Uh, first of all, let the folks know what you do. Uh, Damian Walker, I'm the founder um, of Cognitive Justice International, nonprofit where we focus on justice uh, solutions for issues that are out there. So right now we're focusing on something of, of voting rights and also training agencies to learn how to work with the, the population that has barriers and also training those individual barriers that have been impacted by the justice system or haven't had opportunities to just take advantage of some of the um, educational and other opportunities in society. Um, all right, then. And one of the things that I, I think is important, I, and I say this all the time, why we, we got to have school, Schoolhouse Rock 2.0, yeah. is so many people who literally have no clue, no understanding of how all of these dots are connected. Yes. When you talk about public policy, what they care about uh, on, on the ground, and the individuals who are actually making these decisions. Yes, yes. So I think the individuals that make the decisions, the people have to be educated. So I'm formerly incarcerated. I was incarcerated at the age of 16 and released at the age of 33, so right at 17 years. So a lot of times we miss out on those experiencing growing up and being taught about voting and being taught about policy and being taught about the importance of voting locally um, and not just focusing on the national politics. So when you have individuals that come from... Uh, backgrounds like myself, they have to be educated because mm -hmm. they've never been educated. So it's not even a re-education, it's an education. So all those well, especially things... even even on who has the right to vote. Yes. Uh, I mean, we, 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 we see what's happening in Florida where, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, Governor Ron DeSantis is, trying, is, is, is going after folks yes. uh, with, with the right to vote, even though the state uh, sent them applications, told them exactly. that they could. Uh, and so now folks are trapped into that. We saw that happening uh, with a brother who was actually in line uh, on this campus for, for forever. And then all of a sudden they came after him by saying, oh, he wasn't really uh, authorized and wasn't allowed to vote. Because yes. understanding what is your status, even if you're out of jail or prison, and if you are able to vote uh, so you don't get into further trouble, because we see Republicans are actually targeting targeting yes. the formerly incarcerated. You have to understand the voting rights and the voting laws in your state. So, for instance, Texas. Texas, if you are off parole, off probation, or you have been exonerated from a crime, you immediately get your voting rights back. And if you come from TDC, which is our state prison system, once you are released off parole, they will send you a registration card. So you basically have to understand the voting rights in your state. That's what's most important. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and th those training sessions, how have they gone? Uh, and how many people have you reached? How many people have you touched? I think I be, so because I partner with certain agencies, the, the, the focus is um, probably over the last year, maybe close to a thousand because we partner with other right. agencies. Um, there's one agency here in Houston that they actually go into the jails, Harris County Jail, and they register individuals to vote. And now they've made Harris County Jail 701. Um, they've made that a, a polling station, so the men and women would come down once they register to vote and they're eligible. They would come down in a jail in Harris County to vote. And um, and, and, and we're seeing other states who are now understanding this, uh, who are making efforts. 
to to expand and provide opportunities for the formerly incarcerated to yes. vote. Uh, but again, it's still a struggle, and I keep telling people it's based upon your state. Yes. They may be watching what's happening here or in Florida or somewhere else, but your state may be totally different. Yes. So you have to focus on your state because if you don't, you'll get frustrated and then you'll frustrate the masses because there are people that want to vote. When I got my voting rights back, I felt like a citizen. So there are individuals that actually want to vote. In Harris County, 1,500 people become eligible to vote, register to vote every year. But there's not a focus on those individuals. We call them the forgotten voter. Nobody's really reaching out to them. Nobody has a campaign for them. So it's on individuals like myself and other individuals that know to be able to educate these men and women to, that you can vote in your state. But that information has to be made more. I'm one person, and if it's 15 other people, but nationally, or even throughout Texas with the certain agencies, there are thousands of people that are focused on people that are already are able to vote. So just think, 1,500 every year become available to vote. What happened over the last five years? What about those individuals that didn't vote over the last five years in Harris County alone? So, so what is the argument that you make? What do you say to someone uh, who says, all right, Damon, look, I mean, uh, that's great, you got your... Like, and they may have it, but they're just not interested and don't care. So, you know, what are you saying to them specifically, trying to get them to understand that not taking advantage of it, you actually uh, are making your situation worse? I would ask them, what do they care about? Like, that's what you have to ask somebody who's saying that they don't care. What do you actually care about? Is it your family? Is it your neighborhood? Is it um, school districts? What do you actually care about? And then we'll focus on that. But again, it comes down to educating them. There's no such thing for ed education about voting or re-education when they never got the initial education. So you really have to go ground level, as the professor was saying earlier, you have to go ground level on some of these individuals and some of these populations. It's not just individuals, it's populations. There's groups of people in Houston around the nation who just don't understand the power that they have or the influence that they have in their area. And educate them to start right here where you live at. That's what's most important. All right, then, uh, Damian Walker, we appreciate it. If folks want to get more information on your organization, where'd they go? Uh, you can go to CJI Cognitive Justice International. So CJI.name. CJI.name. All right. Sure, appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, sir. All right, folks. Uh, when we come back, we're going to go to break right now. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation uh, here in the campus of Texas Southern University. We'll also be talking to some of our experts uh, as well, like Lurie Daniels Favors. Uh, this is, again, uh, a huge, huge issue. And so we're focusing on this election, on voting, and how it impacts you. And trust me, uh, this game on, folks, because the other side... We know exactly how hard they are fighting uh, to keep many of us from not accessing the ballot box. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered here at the Black Star Network. Don't forget to download the Black Star Network app, available on all platforms, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also support us with our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to do what do we do. Uh, so you can see and check in money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. And don't forget to get uh, my new book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available from the publisher, Ben Bella Books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, Bookshop, Catalyst, Book Book Books A Million, Target. And you can also order through your favorite black bookstore. We'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Libraries empower the community with education. Liberia Economic Development Initiative, LETI, is hosting the International Life Changers Awards and Liberia's Bicentennial to celebrate LETI building the country's first modern public library and technology center. Join event host Roland Martin, our honorees, Reverend Dr. Jamal Bryant, Zernona Clayton, Thomas Dorch Jr., Dana Lupton, Dr. Tammy Graysteel on October 29th at the CNN Center Atlanta. There are no public libraries in Liberia, but together we can change that. Get tickets at ledinow.org. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. 
white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Kim Whitley. Yo, what's up? This your boy Ice Cube. Hey, yo, peace, world. What's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin, Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Glad to have you here. We are on the campus of Texas Southern University, where we're partnering with Black Voters Matter, talking about the importance of this election and really breaking down uh, a lot of the uh, crucial issues uh, that we are facing uh, in uh, this election. Uh, and, so, uh, so, and, and so what's happening nationally, you're seeing the battle that's being waged, as I said, in courtrooms, uh, and it's really going on in communities everywhere. We're also seeing uh, what's happening uh, when it comes to the, the, the polls. I mean, you've got poll workers, and you're gonna, now you're going to have, as a result, a lot of these new laws, especially here in Texas, people who are allowed to examine the work that they do. Uh, all this is after the big lie in Donald Trump and the MAGA folks after the 2020 election when he simply got mad because he lost. And yeah, take the L. But no, he refuses to do so. So what Republicans did while in power, they then began to use that power to begin to change election laws, even in states where he won, like here in Texas. Uh, you're talking about change laws in Georgia. We've seen it in Arizona, in Iowa, uh, a number of states, Florida, all across the country. And so this is a concerted effort uh, that we're seeing all across this nation. Uh, all right, folks, uh, joining us right now uh, is uh, Lori Daniels Favors. First of all, she, of course, has this radio show on Sirius XM uh, every single day. Uh, but she, uh, but that's, that, that, that's what she moonlights. Uh, she has another job, of course, where she uh, is very much uh, involved uh, in these legal uh, matters. And so she'll tell us about that. Lori, what's happening? Hey, Brother Roland, how are you? Good to be with hey, you hey, again, Roland. sir. Uh, Indeed, indeed. So glad to have you here. So, um, so, so first and foremost, first and foremost, um, I, I talked about what is happening all across the country. Talked about, um, you know, not just the changing of the laws, but how they are now unleashing folks to target poll workers, individuals like my parents who, who you know, they've been doing this for years. But now, all of a sudden, we saw how they, they were attacking them. The woman testified before the January 6th committee, uh, how they were putting their names out there, and they were getting death threats. Uh, and so there are poll workers, many of them who are elderly, a lot of them who are African-American, uh, and some have said, I'm not wasting my time even working uh, these polls because I don't want to be attacked just for, just for being a public servant. You know, what we see when we when those things are happening and when we're seeing people all across the country who are intent on making it dangerous for poll workers, who are intent on making it difficult for ballots to be counted, all based on the big lie, what we're really seeing is the continuation of centuries of developing expertise in how to intentionally exclude Black people from being able to vote, or as I like to call it, from being able to pick the king. Uh, and so this is really more of what we've seen in decades decades gone past, those of us who are part of Gen X or younger, some of this feels a little strange because we've had these nearly 60 plus years of integration. And during integration, we were supposed to have done away uh, with some of those uh, white nationalist efforts. Uh, but the reality is that we now have an entire segment of our population, of the American population that has come out of the racist closet. And they are willing to not just spout their beliefs verbally, but they are also willing to take action, which is why we need uh, not just leadership from the federal government, but we need to 
make sure that the boards of elections in states and municipalities, uh, that governors and that legislative bodies all across the country are taking action to ensure the sanctity, the physical sanctity, not just of our poll sites, but of our poll workers as well. Um, I, I mentioned with Dr. Douglas the, 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 the legal battles, and, and I really don't think uh, the public really understands uh, this war that's being waged. I mean, it is literally being waged on all fronts, on every issue. We're talking about now in Georgia how they allow to change a law where anybody can challenge thousands of registered voters and now you've created this laborious task to actually prove it, and they are removing people from the voting rolls. That's right. And when we, what I always like to remind people is when we see language like that, what they mean is any white person can challenge a ballot, right? Because I would love to see a bunch of brothers and sisters uh, and family and friends from our communities go into some of these other spaces and try to challenge votes, try to raise an issue about the sanctity or the validity of the voters in those communities. And we know how that's going to turn out. So for our brothers and sisters who are living in communities or in living in states or jurisdictions that are governed by uh, folks like Brian Kemp, uh, who hopefully will not be a governor for much longer, uh, but when you're living in a community where basically one party has decided they want to return to not the 1860s, but the 1760s, the 1660s, when it comes to whether or not black people will be able to pick the king, then we need to make sure that in addition to getting souls to the polls, that we are also training young people to stand up. And I, you know, as much as I do not want to see our elders step down from these positions, I love poll workers. The elders there, I feel like it's one of the spaces where intergenerationally we still connect. We do need some young people to be up in these spaces. And I'm just saying, you know, we got a whole lot of folks who do territorial engagement and they want to be big and bad on the block. Can you be big and bad at the poll site? Can you be big and bad and not just defend your turf, but can you defend the elder as he or she is making their way down to the mm. poll site to do the work for the people? Can you be, you can be big and bad on the corner. Can you be big and bad to protect the, the people who are coming to vote to make sure that we're going to have people in positions of power that are going to make it better for all of us? At this point, we are in all hands on deck mode. And I asked my audience earlier this week, if we had to replace the institutions that are currently operated by white people, if we had to replace them and meet our own needs, could we do so? And Roland, it was a, it's really hard for me to realize that for a lot of our communities, our only thought as it pertains to how we can do for self is holding other communities accountable, is, is doing the work of uh, making sure that we're, uh, we're going to get those police officers and we're going to charge them and we're going to make sure that uh, we're defending our rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to defend our rights and we want to hold people accountable and we want to press lawsuits and we want to do the work of making sure that we are not under attack. But we also have to take on the other side of that mantle, which is doing for self, organizing our own communities, our young people to get to the polls, creating our own community watches. Every other community does a community watch. We should be be engaged in community watch for protecting our voters and protecting our ability to cast the ballot. Uh, because the reality is we are participating in determining who is going to sit in that king position. And if we're not going to be as serious about that as some of us are about defending territory, territory that we don't even own, then what are we really doing? You know, you made that a point. I remember when uh, uh, Fox News lost their, their damn minds over the new Black Panthers at polling locations, and hell, they were black polling locations. And you're absolutely right. I mean, having our folks uh, literally say, okay, fine, y'all want to roll up in our community? Go roll up in your community. And then when they start yelling, it was like, uh, I'm sorry, we're following the law. I mean, just very reminiscent of when the Black Panthers went, went to the state capitol in Sacramento and the white folks lost their minds and they said, oh, no, same law. What did they do? The white folks changed the law. So did. They changed the law. Uh, and so, so, so maybe if thousands of black folks roll up in white neighborhoods and go to the polls, they may say, hey, change that damn law. We can't have just anybody walking up in here uh, doing this. And, but, and, and you're right, for all these, these keyboard gangsters out there, uh, the, people, the people who sit here and whine and complain, uh, and, and, you know, in terms of, okay, well, you know, what y'all going to do? And see, and I know I'm, some of them get mad at me right now. So all you FBA, ADOS, B1 people, where y'all at? Y'all got smoke for everybody else who want to do something. When y'all going to show up and actually organize yourselves and say, fine, uh, this, this is how we're going to do it. Yeah, I said it. 
I'm, I, listen, I, I heard it and we all heard it loud and clear, but the reality is it's one thing to be a keyboard gangster. It's another thing to be real about this life. And if you're real about this life, and by that, I mean, if you're real about black people being able to control our communities, if you're real about making sure that our water is clean, if you're real about making sure hospitals aren't being shut down in our communities, if you're real about making sure uh, that we're going to have expanded access to health care in the entire black belt, which is led by Republicans who refuse to embrace Obamacare, if you're real about making sure that black people are going to be able to have housing, if you're real about making sure we can send our kids to schools and that our children's emotional well-being will be centered, not just uh, Karen and Timmy's child uh, who don't want to learn about white supremacy and the unearned privileges that they and their family have. If you really about this life, then let's put our words, let's put our feet where our words are. I would love to see, yeah, it would be great to have a bunch of us go into their communities uh, and start checking their election or questioning their elections, but I would rather see that same energy come here to defend Black people who are trying to vote. I would love to see, uh, instead of us going at each other over whether or not we think uh, an executive order is going far enough, why don't you take that energy to the polls, make sure Grandma, Grandpa, uh, young sister, young brother, everybody in between who wants to vote is going to be protected and able to do so. We have a whole lot of energy when it comes to battling each other. I would love to see us take that energy and instead of battling each other, defend each other's right to participate in kingmaking time because our clean water, clean air, job security, voting rights, housing, criminal legal reform, education reform, literally everything we rely on for sustaining ourselves is on the ballot this year. Uh, I remember in, actually it was 2016, 2018, actually in 2020 as well, uh, and looking at uh, data from Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, looking at uh, NNPA, uh, looking at others. Uh, when, when the question was asked, uh, are you enthusiastic or are you likely to vote? And so when you begin to look at that chart, black folks, 65 plus, highest, uh, vote, their whole deal is like, yeah, we're doing it. In fact, I remember when Melanie Campbell uh, and the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation uh, had one of their phone banks. Uh, one of the workers, they, I forgot the state they called, and it was an black, old black woman called, and she's like, baby, look, I don't need y'all calling me. I don't need <laughs> y'all calling me, asking me by election day. She said, my son coming to pick me up at this time, take me to the poll, and bringing me back home. She said, y'all should be calling somebody else. And mm -hmm. the woman who was called, she cracked up laughing, but she literally was like, baby, I don't need you calling me. She's like, I got this. Uh, and uh, it was it was in it was in 2020 I think when I was in uh, I was in Dallas uh, I think it was the first day of early voting and it was a trip because the day before old black folks were driving up the day before saying now look is this where voting is tomorrow what time they wow. they, they were doing they, they literally had like an advanced team they were scouting it out and when the poll opens they were there but when but, right but 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 when you look at the data there. As you go down, 65 plus, and then it was 55 plus, and then when you then when you go down to you know uh, 45, 55, then you go 35, 45, and you keep going down, that number gets lower and lower and lower. And the reality is, the two largest groups of people right now, population-wise in America, are 18, 35. That's the two lowest groups. Uh, so the question is. Your message, you there, you, you, your institute's there on Mega Evers uh, campus. You That's know, right. what are you saying to all these young folks who who are complaining about boomers, but boomers vote? Here's the thing, and this is something that uh, one of my team members at the Center for Law and Social Justice at Mega Evers College, where I do my real job, my, not my moonlighting job, uh, on serious. Uh, one of the things that he says, Isaiah, shout out to him. He always says that, listen, if you're in that 18 to 35 year old group and you're not going to vote. Be cool and be clear with the fact that the people who are 65, 85, 95, they're going to vote. If you have an 85-year-old person who's voting, who's going to be making decisions, I don't mean to be crass about this, but the reality is the 18 to 35-year-old community is going to be living with the decisions that that 85-year-old voter cast a whole lot longer than the 85-year-old is. One of the things we have to recognize, however, is that the younger we are in our community, the farther we are away from having actual experience and engagement with the civil rights struggle and the struggle for the right to vote. So if we have young people who are not learning about any of this stuff in school, I'm talking about not learning civics in school, certainly not learning about how black civics works in school. They're also not learning it in our religious institutions because our, our numbers and our attendance in churches have gone down. And if we're hoping that they're going to make it to college to be able to figure out how to take a political science or, you know, go to a, a great uh, institution like an HBCU or PBI, 
we've literally been willing to, by that, those choices, sacrifice entire generations of, commu of our members, of community members, when it comes to their knowledge about how this system works. We had people who came out to the streets and protested in 2020, uh, Roland. I know you remember this, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. And one of the things I always ask people who tell me, oh, I ain't going to vote, because we have a lot of young people who's like, miss, I ain't voting. I don't believe in electoral politics. That's something y'all do. It don't really work. My vote don't count. And I'm like, all right, cool. Did you protest in 2020? Yeah, I was out in them streets. We was in them streets. Oh, that's so good. Were you just there for like blowing off emotional steam or did like, did you actually want something to change? Because if you actually wanted something to change instead of just having an emotional outburst where you let out your anger and your frustration um, and you were able to sort of emotionally purge yourself, if you actually wanted something to change, yes, there is a portion of change that can happen at the grassroots level. But right now, Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, not having clean water, we can't fix that just with the grassroots. We need government. When it comes to funding our schools and making sure our babies have computers instead of textbooks written in the 19s, as my daughter likes to call it, we can do some with the grassroots, but we need government. When it comes to getting a moratorium on evictions, when it comes to extending unemployment insurance so that when we are all laid off during a pandemic, God forbid, we will have some money coming into houses to sustain ourselves, you can do some rent parties, you can do a lot at the grassroots level, but at a certain point, you're going to need government. And if you protested in 2020 because you wanted substantive change, the substantive change doesn't happen because you had an emotional outburst. The substantive change happens when you change the people who are in positions of power. Let's look at Jackson, Mississippi. Who cleans, the, who's in charge of cleaning the water? If there's someone who is in charge of cleaning the water, how does that person get their job? Are they voted into office? Are they appointed to that position? Because if they're voted in the office, how are you gonna tell me voting don't matter when right now you can't drink clean water? If they're appointed to office, who appoints them? Is that person elected? Because that is the person that we now need to change positions. So when we're talking about election and engagement, we have to recognize young folks just do not understand how standing in line and voting changes anything in the community. And, and that's not their fault. That's on us. I'm Gen X. I'm young Gen X. But the reality is it is on us to provide the opportunities that they're going to need to make those connections. When I go into a classroom and I'm talking to some high school students, they don't want to hear me talk about it's your ancestral duty and obligation to vote. Half of them don't even know what I mean when I'm talking about ancestors because we did a poor job of teaching them to respect our elders and ancestral veneration. But if I ask them, Hi, what y'all think about NYPD? Y'all like how they work here? Y'all like how they, y'all, are y'all cool with how they, we're getting put up against the wall on your way to school? Are you cool with school uh, safety officers in your community, in your schools, giving you, taking you through metal detectors before you can come in, speaking to you disrespectfully? No. Well, who tells them how to police? Oh, the police commissioner, how he get his job? Oh, she, now we have a woman. How did she get her job? She was appointed by the mayor. Did your family vote? Did you vote for the mayor? Did you know what the policies the mayor was gonna implement when the, when the mayor was gonna be picking the police commissioner? Were you in agreement with that? Because if you weren't, you could have picked somebody else. Oh, but you didn't vote. You see how now you're being policed in ways you don't like because you didn't participate in picking the king who was gonna determine what the policing apparatus was gonna look like in your community? We have to make connections, starting with what they care about and then show how what they care about is impacted, right. shaped, and challenged in, in the electoral process. And that's why I, I constantly talk about connecting the dots. Uh, I tell the story in 2016. Uh, I had my radio show. I, a young lady called me from North Carolina, uh, and she says, look, I'm not feeling Hillary. I can't vote for her. I'm not feeling Trump. I can't vote for him. So she said, I'm just going to focus on uh, my state. And I said, OK, interesting. I said, so what are the three or four issues that you're focusing on? And so she told me, well, the crazy thing is the three to four issues she, she told me about literally I showed her the direct connection between who sits in the Oval Office and those three to four issues. And she was literally stunned. She was shocked. She, she was just, she's like, I, 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 can't, I can't believe this. And I said, How? And, and, she, and, she, and, she, and she said that she was a activist, well-informed. I said, yeah, you're not actually well-informed. The fact that she could not understand that who sits in the Oval Office appoints Supreme Court justices, appoints federal judges. They rule on voting issues in her own state. She mm -hmm. wasn't, she didn't even understand the lawsuit that was actually happening at that moment where they were suing uh, the North Carolina voter suppression law in federal court. Wow. And mm. she was stunned by, and, and that's, so that's why I would say we have to actually connect the dots for people, just like I think we finally, after, after all these decades,
people now understand you cannot be so concerned about mass incarceration but ignore who's running for DA. That's right. You can yell, holler, and scream about Congress to change things, but the, but the one person who has the most effect on mass incarceration and criminal justice reform in the United States is the local DA because right. their decision as to how they prosecute cases has a direct impact on that. And people have finally gotten to understand that. You know, I like to say that we don't live in a country with a king or a queen, right? We don't have a monarchy here. And if you live in a country with a king or a queen, how you get charges pressed against you is determined by the king. If you live in a country with the king, and I, I, my audience knows I say this all the time, when it comes to whether or not you get clean water, well, did the king say your community could have clean water? Because if not, you ain't going to have no clean water. When it comes to whether or not you can have a hospital, well, did the king say can you have a hospital? Because if the king ain't say you can have a hospital, you ain't going to have no hospital. In this country, the kings are the people who got the most votes because the people who get the most votes determine whether or not a hospital stays open in a black community or gets shut down. The people who got the most votes determines whether or not that DA, get the, the, the DA that wins is gonna determine whether you have equitable, progressive criminal legal system reform or if you're gonna have something that looks closer to slave patrols in the 1700s. And so the reality is we have to be clear about creating educational opportunities for our community that fill in that gap. Some of the things that we're doing at the Center for Law and Social Justice, we have every Wednesday for the next up and from now until the election, we're breaking down the ballot. We're taking each office. We're talking about what it is, virtual programming, free of charge, of course, uh, that we provide for local community members in black language and in ways with examples that we can understand to break down and explain the ballot. We launched an 11-week advocacy academy course that we provide for the community so they can learn how to be effective advocates because I love a good protest as much as anybody. But if my protest is not connected to electoral engagement, then it becomes just an emotional outlet. It does not get tied to any substantive change. We had those same protests in New York City going back to 2020. Those folks protested so hard and so well and so long and so effectively, they forced the then mayor, Bill de Blasio, to create a racial justice commission. Uh, full disclosure, I'm one of the commissioners. Out of that commission, we put together three ballot proposals that are going to put the city on a path forward to embracing racial equity as a central governing paradigm. Three proposals. And it's beautiful. We had hearings, we had testimony, all triggered by protests. But if New Yorkers don't come out and vote for them, then it all becomes theory. The protests could lead to substantive change if people understand that that substantive change requires them to go to the ballot box and actually vote on the proposals, vote on the people who are in alignment with what it is that you want. And I'll just share this. I had a guest on earlier this week, Kelly Huff, and she made it real clear. She said, how am I supposed to trust you? You talking about you want to be a part of the revolution and you, you bout about it with the revolution and you ain't going to stand in line for half an hour and cast a ballot. Like, are you really dependable? How much can we actually depend upon you? So in addition to making sure our people understand how to connect the dots, we have to give them pathways forward that lead them from my frustration and my anger and my concern with the lack of my needs being met to actually engaging in the process in ways that will provide meaningful change for them. All right. Lori Daniels favors. Always a pleasure. Tell folks when you're on SiriusXM. We are on SiriusXM for the Larie Daniel Favor Show, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern, every single day. Give us a call, 866-801-8255, to chime in for the conversation. I appreciate the, being able to talk with you about this, Roland. You know I care about this issue a lot. I could tell just a little bit. A little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. break here and when we come back uh, we're going to be chatting with uh, some folks here uh, some of y'all students yeah I'm going to put y'all in the hot seat yeah, ask, oh don't be don't be look you roll in here you're going to have to answer something uh, so we'll talk to some of them we'll also talk to uh, Reese Cobra she's here Monique Pressler is here also uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee Beto O'Rourke others will be coming through here over the next hours so looking forward to having that conversation folks if you're watching on YouTube hit the damn like button it ain't that hard it's real simple like then go comment all right y'all love comment hit the like button uh, same thing uh, you show Facebook share it as well and those of you who are watching Instagram and Twitch and other platforms uh, be sure to do the exact same thing uh, as well 
Also, download the Black Star Network app available on all platforms. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And, of course, uh, you can support our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to do what we do. So your dollar, send your check and money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, Dollar Sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal's R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo's RM Unfiltered. Zell is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. <coughs> rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. And don't forget, get your copy of my book, White Fear, How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Uh, you can get it uh, at any bookstore, Ben Bella Books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, Bookshop, Chapters, Books a Million, Target, or you can order from your favorite black bookstore. Download it also from Audible. We'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing, creating, making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Libraries empower the community with education. Liberia Economic Development Initiative, LEDI, is hosting the International Life Changers Awards and Liberia's Bicentennial to celebrate LEDI building the country's first modern public library and technology center. Join event host Roland Martin, our honorees, Reverend Dr. Jamal Bryant, Zernona Clayton, Thomas Dorch Jr., Dana Lupton, Dr. Tammy Gray Steele on October 29th at the CNN Center Atlanta. There are no public libraries in Liberia, but together we can change that. Get tickets at ledinow.org. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. I'm Jebra Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. My name is Charlie Wilson. Hi, I'm Sally Richardson Whitfield. And I'm Dodger Whitfield. Hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, Unfiltered. <laughs> Welcome back to Roller Martin Unfiltered. We're here on the campus of Texas Southern University talking election. Huge uh, elections coming up, not only in this state, but all across the country as well. Uh, getting the thoughts of various folks while we are here. We're joined right now by a couple of TSU students. All right, who you with? Hello, I'm the president of the Black Law Student Association at Thurgood Marsh School of Law here at Texas Southern University. Okay, you, you, and Christian Wolf. Right, but I want to give you a name. Right? Yeah, Christian Wolf. <laughs> all right, you left something out. You left something out. Other than who I am? Uh, you left something out. 
Oh, and I'm fried. Of course, yeah, of course, of course, of course, man. I gotta, gotta show love. Come on now, you supposed to lead with that. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> You supposed to lead with it. All right, go ahead. Hello, my name is Lauren Lacey. I'm a 3L at Thurgood Marshall School of Law. All right, then. All right, so first question, when it comes to this election, what do you care about? I care about making sure that we have somebody that represents us as a, as a people, uh, making sure that the things that we embody as a people are being put forward. Such as? Such as the, I mean, inequalities that we experience every day. I mean, I feel like you have to have somebody that really looks at those things and actually puts that forward. And so... The main thing I'm really looking for in a candidate is, I, I guess you could say, just somebody that really just cares about the people, you know, because sometimes you get a lot of this artificial, you know, kind of talk and stuff, and I, I just feel like that's kind of the things that we've been getting in the, in the politics lately, but I want to make sure we get somebody that cares about us and that feels like they're genuine about what they're saying for the most part. Um, I care about gun safety, I care about health care, and I care about environmental justice. And, on, and when it comes to those issues as well, um, what are the conversations you're having with fellow students? Is that happening as well in terms of uh, uh, um, what they're talking about and, uh, and what they care about? Um, absolutely. I think that a lot of women on campus were having conversations about health care in terms of women's rights, um, the right to choose and forced births and things of that nature. Um, in terms of gun safety, if you have, if my, a lot of my classmates have children, so they're concerned about gun safety when it comes to sending their children to school. Um, and even us being at school, I feel safe at Texas Southern University, but it's still a conversation to be had. Um, and in terms of environmental justice. I know we were having conversations about the water crisis that's in Jackson. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, so Flint is always on my mind, mm -hmm. and them having clean water. So it's definitely a conversation that's being had. Um, I'll ask you this question, Christian, and that is, uh, and we've heard different people have talked about this, that, oh, you've got um, an increasing number of black men who don't care about voting, who aren't interested. Um, what are you hearing? Are you hearing that? Are you hearing the opposite? And what are those issues, concerns you're hearing from uh, brothers you know? Yeah, I mean, I think as a black man, sometimes we feel like our voices isn't hurt or our, vo uh, our votes, votes don't count. And so I think it's very important to show that our votes count for one and that it's not too hard to actually get out and go vote. But people want to see the change. They want to see their vote actually being, you know, translated into actually somebody be, being put in office that they really want. Um, I think by Barack Obama being elected as president, that showed that our voice and that our vote matters. But we just need to continue to see that even in the local elections and not just the, not just the big elections, but in the local elections, every, every election we can actually come out to. And so I think it's something that we just need to keep pushing. But I think we're getting a lot more awareness about, you know, black men being able to vote. I think we're getting somewhere with it. But we just got to keep harping on it as men and hold each other accountable as men to really, you know, drive that home to all the black men in our communities. See, I think that I go back to something that Lori was talking about. Uh, and, and I think there are a lot of people and I hear the same thing. People say, oh, why should we keep voting Democrat? Why should we keep voting? Uh, nothing has changed. And what I keep reminding people is that the folk who get stuff aren't just the folks who vote, but the ones who also show up to press those who vote after the election. Uh, and, and we see some of that. But look, I cover city council in Fort Worth. I cover county government when I was in Austin. Uh, I've done the exact same thing other times. All too often, when I see groups of African Americans showing up, it's actually in protest to something, as opposed to what's you know what initiatives coming up and how are we flooding the city council chambers and in, 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 in the in the in the school board meeting. And so, what I'm constantly trying to remind people is, we've got to mobilize and organize ourselves after the election to get the things that they promised or the things that we say we want. We just can't go, oh, well, I voted, I'm good, they're there, now y'all go ahead and do it. That's, that's actually not how it works. Pressure bus pipes. You got to show up. Go ahead, comment. I agree. I do think that you have to show up, but I think that, as Professor Douglas was saying, um, you have to have that initial education, but I think what we also have to consider is communication. Um, I think I was listening to a podcast, I forget which one, it's probably NPR or something, and they were talking about how when they had an issue, there was a phone tree. 
and that phone tree went out to inform the parents at the school of whatever issue was happening. So I think that there are people in the community that are implementing different methods and different ways that we can keep one another informed, and I just think that we all together need to make sure that we're tapping into that um, outside of protests and outside of social media. Um, as you said, connecting the dots is really important, but we have to, in doing that, make sure that we're informing people of what the dots are. So I think um, enhancing communication, I think, will definitely help with that issue. Well, and, and that's, that's also where I tell uh, folks, uh, we also have to be honest about what we listen to, who we listen to, and what we're reading as well. And, 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 and I, I get a trip out people say, man, I sure wish we had some folks who are discussing this stuff every day, which is what we do for four years. Uh, and, and they go through this, and, and then they go, oh, oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, just say you didn't realize that, but don't say you didn't, you, you, know, you, you know, I couldn't find this. It was, you know, and th that's what probably drives me crazy the most because, look, there's information out there. People are doing this every single day, but you have to have a willingness to actually step out there and actually get the information. That's what you got to have. Yeah, and I mean, the, I think the thing that we start to see in our community sometimes, we get so bogged down in everything that we have in our daily day lives, and we get so caught up in what we were used to growing up, sometimes being able to transition over into actually getting into these podcasts and get onto these calls and being able to get into these actually uh, these meetings and stuff like this is important because, you know, you need to get outside of your comfort zone. And so sometimes it takes, you know, some injustice or anything of that nature to actually pull it out of people to want to get on these podcasts, to want to get into, you know, these type of streams and these live streams because we're just not interested if it doesn't actually affect us personally. And so sometimes we have to get out of that and we have to actually start figuring out ways that we can actually, you know, touch us personally outside of just, you know, what we see, you know, as injustice. Well, but I, th I think there's some things, though, that, that, that touch us, but it's not always, oh, like, it, it, it touches me directly. Because I think it touches us indirectly. And, and I just think that if, if we wait for something to touch us d d directly or personally, then, uh, then we're making a huge mistake. Uh, look, I, I was highly critical of all these white women who showed up outside the Supreme Court after Roe v. Wade when we had all these black groups who were protesting for the For the People Act and for the John Lewis Act, and it was largely black folks who were out there. And I'm like, oh, what? Like, oh, y'all showed up. Y'all know, know how to roll up on places now, how? Huh? And, and, and that, that's a perfect example. It's like, so, well, you, you showed up after they overturned it, but this is where you should have been before they overturned it. And so I keep telling people, stop waiting, stop playing defense, stop waiting after the fact. You know, same thing, Lurie made this point, and I've said this well, when it comes to all these people who were at George Floyd protests, the same folk, when we were talking then, after the fact, um, for those various bills, George Floyd Justice Act, there should have been the amount of energy put into George Floyd protests, there should have been the same energy into the protest to get the George Floyd Justice Act passed. Same thing. But again, a lot of folk are, as she said, operating on emotion as opposed to are you in this for the long haul or you in, or you simply in it for this quick high and now you can just post on social media you went to a protest. That's what drives me crazy. Okay, you laugh. Cause I, you, you know I ain't lying. Cause you like... I, I don't think you're lying. However, I do think... I can, I'm black, obviously. So for black people, a lot of people are in survival mode. They wake up in the morning, they go to work, they grind in, you know? So I think pocketbook issues and those issues that touch them directly mm -hmm. are the triggers for them to become involved in politics and say, okay, what? What happened? Whose fault is this? Um, so with connecting the dots in terms of education, I think we really have to say, hey, this is an issue, a pocketbook issue that you're having. This is who we're No, I, mean, I, I get pocketbook. You know? I get pocketbook. But I purposely use a George Floyd example. Okay. That wasn't pocketbook. And we're talking about millions of people in cities all across the country. But when Congress was actually de debating and actually negotiating the George Floyd Justice Act, mm -hmm. you didn't have 1% of the protest. And I believe that had 25% of those protests took place to get the law passed, it would have put the, the amount of pressure needed on Congress to get it done. 
But when they didn't see pressure, they were like, oh, we good. We ain't going to really do nothing. And, and, and that's what I'm saying. And so I think we have to constantly challenge people. Same thing when it comes to voting. Yes, we want you to vote. But we also want to see you do something when the election is over. Because that's actually how things get done after the fact. And I think we got to keep preaching that. And there's so many people who talk about we need this, 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 and they've actually never stepped foot in a school board meeting, a council meeting. you got to go where the power is. You can't just yell and scream, how we, I want something, and not go where the power is to actually get it. That's, that, that's what I'm saying right there. Final comments. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, in, cl- in closing, I, I feel like that goes back to educating everybody about what the power lies, where the power lies, and what power we actually have. And so we all want to be there in the big protests and the big rallies, and it looks good, and you know everybody's all hyped up. But like you said, the real action happens behind the scenes or when you actually go to make those votes. And so we actually have to educate our people on what is going to be in the legislation, what is being passed, what we need to vote on, what is actually at stake, what's the big controversy, because sometimes we don't even really understand the true controversy behind some of these decisions. The Dobb decisions, people don't really understand the true controversy behind some of these decisions. And so I think the education and being able to give people the actual the actual security that, you know, hey, what you're, what you're feeling is okay, but let's try to put this in a way that actually we can make a difference. And so some people don't feel like they're qualified to make a difference. They don't feel like they're qualified to be in those meetings. They don't feel like they're qualified to even go, you know, to even vote sometimes. And so I think that we need to give people that security to do that as well. Thank you. Um, the Barbara C. Jordan chapter of Black Law Student Association will be here at Texas Southern University in partnership with Hall YP to register people to vote on Tuesday, October 10th. So please come out and see us. Please get registered to vote. Um, I hope that by watching the show and having this conversation, you are empowered wi- within your right to vote and that you're gaining knowledge and you're connecting the dots to know that your vote matters. All right, one more. So you're going to be registered in the vote. What's the plan of action to get them to the polls? Huh? I'll take whoever to the poll that needs to go. <laughs> we should do a march to the poll. That's what it sounds like. No, I'm just asking. Yeah. I'm just asking because I was in I was at CBC last week and I, I posed the same question of the D9 leaders. I'm like, we have all these initiatives to get people to register, but we got, how are you going to turn out? And folks are kind of like, that's a good point. All right. So you're sponsoring a bus to the poll. Huh? You're sponsoring a bus to the poll. You pole. said you're driving? I drive whoever. I'm just saying. I got it. I'm just saying, I'm just checking. All right. I'm just checking. See, you the one for, y'all, y'all didn't see on camera when I was like, we got some students. She was like, uh, what questions you asking? I, I did. Like, and I said, whatever comes out of my mouth. And I answered. See, there you go. So why, why were you initially all, oh, no. It doesn't no. hurt to ask. Mm-mm. No, no see, has never hurt anyone. See, we, see, we, see, we know. And that was my response. See, when you got well, swagger, you like, man, ask whatever. I got this. Did I not do a good job? See, huh? I did a great job. Yeah, that's all right. So we're good. That's all right. I mean, <laughs> we want to thank you, Roland, for having us. Thank you. Back off to the association, and we're glad to have you at TSU. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. All right, folks, got to go to a break. We come back. Y'all hold on one second. I got to go to a break. We'll continue having our conversation. I'll be talking to more folks uh, as well. Reese here? Oh, I ain't hear her cussing, so I ain't realize. I ain't real. I ain't realize. Y'all, I, I ain't hear her coming and cussing. I ain't realize Reese was here. Uh, so I'll be chatting with Reese. I'll be chatting with Monique. And I'll be chatting with. Ah, ah, ah. Monique, stop talking. I got this. And I'll be chatting with Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee as well. Uh, this ain't my first rodeo. Just sit over there and type on your phone. All right, folks. Uh, of course, uh, we're here on the campus of Texas Southern University. I'm glad to be here talking about this election, the importance of it, uh, issues, what matters to our people, and why also we must understand the power of our vote and not have untapped power. Uh, and speaking of that, I want to thank a bunch of y'all who, who uh, saw my interview today on The Breakfast Club. You can check it out on their YouTube channel. Y'all know I was straight bringing the funk, even when it came to that ignorant fool Kanye. Uh, and so check it out uh, on their YouTube channel. And don't forget to support us in what we do. Download the Black Star Network app, available on all platforms, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And support us in what we do by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans on an annual basis, contributing 50 bucks. That's $4.19 cents a month, 13 cents a day. Check your money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal's R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. 
and get your copy of my book, White Fear, how the Brownie of America is making white folks lose their minds. Lord, they've been losing their minds even in my interviews. Uh, and so we've been having some great ones and some great conversations and so great chats this week again on The Breakfast Club with my man Sway, a Sirius XM, uh, Bevy Smith, uh, and others. Uh, you can get it at Ben Bella Books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, Bookshop, Catalyst, Books A Million, Target. You can order from your favorite black bookstore or you can download it from Audible. We'll be right back. All right. Now y'all done. Congresswoman? When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Libraries empower the community with education. Liberia Economic Development Initiative, LETI, is hosting the International Life Changers Awards and Liberia's Bicentennial to celebrate LETI building the country's first modern public library and technology center. Join event host Roland Martin, our honorees, Reverend Dr. Jamal Bryant, Zernona Clayton, Thomas Dorch Jr., Dana Lupton, Dr. Tammy Gray Steele, on October 29th at the CNN Center Atlanta. There are no public libraries in Liberia, but together we can change that. Get tickets at ledinow.org. Pull up a chair, take your seat at the Black Table with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. everybody, it's your girl Lunell. So what's up, this is your boy Earthquake. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Roland Martin Unfiltered, we're here on the campus of Texas Southern University, glad to be here. Talk about the importance of voting. Black Voters Matter. Uh, they, uh, of course, have the blackest bus in, the t in town. They are uh, traveling all around the city and state and the country as well. Uh, of course, registering our folks and also getting them educated on the issues that matter. My next guest, uh, she's one of those folks who fights the good fight uh, in the halls of Congress. Uh, joining us now from Ace Town, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Congresswoman, how you doing? I'm rolling. I am so excited to welcome you to the historic 18th Congressional District and the doubly historic Texas Southern University, born out of the ashes of segregation when a single student was told by the University of Texas, there is no room for you at the end, created uh, out of those uh, historic beginnings, and now having one of the highest enrollments uh, in its history, but still 
looking upward to be recognized by this state. One of the things that um, absolutely drives me crazy uh, is when I listen to people and they go, man, Congressional Black Caucus don't do a damn thing. <laughs> they, they, they don't, and, and, and Pete, they start going on this whole deal. And, 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 and then when you correct folks, oh, all you're doing is kissing up. Oh, that's all your buddies. You're trying to save them. And, and, and I tell folks all the time, the average person literally has no clue what a member of Congress does. They, they really don't, okay? And, and, and I know when you're going around, you, you hear people say the exact same thing, and it has to be frustrating when people who literally do not understand uh, what a member of Congress does and the number of things that have been passed by this House that the CBC played a huge role in. Amazing. Billions of dollars. I mean, we can go on and on and on, and folk act like that stuff just happened just because. No, it didn't. It absolutely did not. And you know what? I don't mind taking the uh, the challenge of what do we do, and then I have to say back and say, what have you read? What do you look? What do you see? What do you understand? Because civic power comes from civic responsibility. But you know what? I'll try to be empathetic and simply say that I want black lives to matter and I want black votes to matter. So here's what we do. First of all, the largest amount and continuing amount of dollars to historically black colleges, $2.7 billion just a couple of weeks ago, $500 million in 2021, and more dollars to come. Uh, more dollars accessible to the various legislative initiatives that we've passed collectively, but with 57 votes, the Congressional Black Caucus played a strategic role in the negotiation of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, which is the bill with about $700 billion that's going to be in your neighborhood tomorrow or the next well, day. Well, first, total was $1.2 trillion. That is correct. $700 billion is going to be in transportation. That's correct. And you mentioned HBCUs. That's 228,000 students. That's also that's faculty, that's staff. And where many of these HBCUs are, that's an economic engine in the community as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Strategically engaged in that. Members of uh, the CBC on the Transportation Committee. Um, sizable but quiet uh, opportunities for MWBEs. We didn't leave that out. Small businesses. We have oversight, all of that. Uh, the work with the Department of Transportation specifically had in the language that this administration is looking for equity uh, and for neighborhoods to be treated equitably. Uh, and dollars to go out equity. So that's, that's one. Inflation Reduction Act. It was clearly the Congressional Black Caucus, among many other things, that uh, fought for climate change, but more importantly, environmental center, $3 billion that is dedicated to communities of color, which we know that we are the butt side, if you will, the backside of toxicity and contamination in many neighbors. Now, that includes contaminated water in Flint, contaminated or no water in Jackson, and con contaminated lead water around uh, the, the country. So we've got $3 billion just out of the Inflation Reduction Act to be able to utilize for communities of color. So that means that, again, when folks are looking at wastewater systems, uh, yeah, you ain't, you're not thinking when you turn that faucet on uh, that what the work CBC uh, made that possible. That I mean, look, I, I, I grew up in Clinton Park here in Houston, mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess for me, I guess the reason why I, 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 I take it personal, because I, I had parents who were co-founders of a civic club, and I saw when the people got involved, we, we got new street lights, paved streets, we got new uh, sewer system, uh, we got refurbished park, we got a, fire, a old fire station that was turned into a senior citizen center, because the people got involved and petitioned government, city hall, county government, state legislature. Congress to get those things. And so when people say, well, I haven't seen changes in my neighborhood, you have to ask the question, what have you done to get changes in your neighborhood? It just, it simply just doesn't happen by itself. You it's, a, it's, a community, it's a community and political partnership. Absolutely. But it is, it is, it is pushing the power down to the people, but it's got to have the people stand out there demanding the power for them. And what happened in your neighborhood with your family was civic participation at its basic level. 
It is yeah. grabbing on to what you deserve. I, I, I remember speaking before the city council in like Monday. the ninth and tenth grade. That's right. That's uh, how, we, we had a city councilman. Uh, who, man, what was his name? Um, it wasn't Justin Robertson. Uh, it was, uh, oh, my God, he had those lamb chops. Uh, McGowan. Oh, McGowan. <laughs> man, he came. So, we, uh, so, I went, so I, our lady started to see Catholic Church. My, my, it was actually found in my grandparents' living room. So we had our annual bazaar, and he came, very well. came to the bazaar, and I start drilling him. Now, mind you, I'm in the ninth grade, and <laughs> well trained. And he was, I, he was like, I don't know who this little black kid hit me with all these questions, and it was, it was something at the time that they, they were trying to they were about to make cuts to pools and parks, and I start just drilling him, and he looked at me like I was crazy, and I said, Oh, I'll be at the city council meeting, and I'm gonna testify before the city council. And he was like, oh, and I said, so when you come back, I expect there to be some answers to what I'm asking. You, that has to be the attitude that we have when we see that member of Congress, we see that city council member, and, and, and again, saying we live here, we want to see some stuff get done. But it's a two-way street. You've got to listen, learn, read, but also you've got to be able uh, to understand that you do have a role once the money comes in normal states. Now, I'm going to distinguish where we are. Right. Explain. In normal states, when the money comes, that governor who is supposed to be an intermediary right. and to pass it down to the local cities, local governments, school boards, uh, and ultimately into individual neighborhoods from Pleasantville to Clinton Park to Acres Home to Third Ward to Sunnyside South Park to way out Humble, Texas, Atascacita, and all in between. Southwest, I don't want to leave you out. Southwest, East End, I don't want to leave you out. All those dollars from what we do in Washington are to get to the people. Right. But they get to the people by a interested governor who is realizing his or her responsibility. Who's supposed to serve all constituents. All constituents uh, and to ensure that the dollars go for what they are. But this we trash governor. We have a problem here. We right. Have a serious problem. Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey purposely did not give money to this county and to the city uh, in particular um, and tried to divide the county and the city. It was four billion dollars. I led the fight for the monies of recovery. Happened to be a bipartisan fight after Hurricane Harvey. We got something like 150 billion dollars. Right. Uh, and but by way of law, it goes through the state and it was supposed to be a pass through, not any kind of layered. Uh, let me test. Your, you know, your attitude or what color clothing are you wearing or are you red or blue? It was supposed to be that people are hurting in our community. And so we still have a potential Title VI discrimination situation because monies did not fully come to the city of Houston, uh, making the argument, oh, you're inside Harris County, which happens to be the fifth largest county in the nation, Houston, the fourth largest city. They're two distinct entities. They needed to get their money. But that needs to be the voices of the community as well, demanding that our governor function. We're still trying to determine where federal funds for the American Rescue Act, the CARES Act, have gone. Some of them, $4 billion at the county, excuse me, at the border with the Lone Star Project, which today was declared worthless by a prosecutor who said, I can't prosecute any of these cases. Four, four billion dollars, all these billion, national guards on the troop, a total waste of money. That is correct. That is what a prosecutor said, because you're bringing me cases that I cannot prosecute, because first of all, you have no jurisdiction all for the stunt. federal issues. We, so taxpayers spend four billion dollars on a stunt. And some of it federal dollars coming out of the money that was sent here for education, for the environment, uh, for the uh, improvement of our infrastructure. And I think these are the kinds of demands that should be asked. You cannot accept someone whose title is governor uh, and you accept them as governor. And the only thing you know that they do is that they're in Austin and they live in the governor's mansion, because that's about the greatest definition that one could give. Because mm -hmm. governors usually are, are standing, uh, cutting the ribbon. They're standing, uh, announcing monies. They're announcing monies coming to Texas Southern University, for example. Got it. Um, it would have been a great star in the governor's cap to give added money to Texas Southern University uh, because of the inequity of years past. The desegregation lawsuit was signed yep. in 2000, well, so settled in 2000, which generated, by the way, this school that you're sitting in um, and um, other 
uh, dollars that came in around that time, but then we still slid backwards. The schools still slid backwards, and I think most of the administration know that, so we're still fighting for equal dollars for Texas Southern University. The governor could have a feather in his cap yep. by designating dollars for an urban university, and it would not have violated any law. He could have talked about lost learning. He could have talked about uh, students who were less uh, economically able. Uh, he could have talked about the infrastructure here. Um, Texas Southern University has done excellent with what it's yep. been given, but it should not suffer, and there should not be a dual system. Black Lives Matter and Black Voters Matter. I'm going to pull in uh, Cliff uh, Albright, Latasha Brown, co-founders of Black Voters Matter. Uh, uh, glad to have them. We are partnering with them on this. They oh, are uh, all around the country. Uh, Cliff and Latasha, uh, we're joined by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. J just explain to people uh, why having real partners like the Congresswoman is important for the work that y'all do and how you explain to folk out there who have assumption that every politician is awful, everybody is lazy, they only care about themselves, that there are African Americans in elected office who are here for black people fighting for these issues and we can't uh, just uh, allow them to be attacked, allow them to be marginalized and why we must ensure that they are returning to office to deliver for us. You know, I, I, a couple of things. One, we, Congresswoman has served not just only the people of Texas, but we have all in this nation benefited from the work that you've done, Congresswoman, uh, particularly around from reparations to fighting to make sure that our communities get resources, to HBCUs get resources, to even hold Congress to account. And so what we have to really recognize is that we actually have an ecosystem of leadership in our community. The goal is how do we come together collectively and get people that are literally going to stand in alignment that come from our community, that are representing our community and are fighting for our community. And we need people on all levels. We need people in the courtrooms. We need people in Congress. We need people on the Supreme Court. We need people in the streets. That is exactly how we make change. We have to have an entire ecosystem of black folks that are standing in alignment saying that we support an agenda that is going to move our community forward and that we work hand in hand to get those things done. There is a, there is a value and when you're having people that are on the inside, that are fighting on the inside, we need uh, what has happened to black folk in this nation, every level. We have to have somebody that is fighting for us, whether they're in the C-suite, you know, whether they are literally in the streets, you know, at the, every single level, because we're being attacked at every single level. And we have to really recognize that we need people on the streets, but we need policy and we need policymakers. But we also have to make sure that if we want to get policymakers in office that are literally going to look out for our interests and guess who got to put them there? We've got to put them there. And that means that we've got to do the work. That means that we've got to come out and vote. Brother Cliff? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't say any better than, than what you just said. And I think it's important for folks to know that, you know, when we have somebody that's willing to fight for us, after we've put them in office, after we've given them power to represent us, and as we're still holding them accountable, that part of that accountability means that we've got to stay engaged. Sometimes we've got to, we've got to uh, push them to even be able to sometimes stay in the line, right? Sometimes uh, 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 Congresswoman Jackson Lee needs us to be making some noise on the outside so that when they go in that negotiation room and they're, they're working out the details on these bills, they can say, look, my people are out there, my constituents are out there, and they're upset, and this is what they're demanding, right? And so there's a, there's a partnership when we get this thing right, when we have people that are representing us and willing to fight for us, and that fight has to take sometimes different um, shapes and sizes, right? Uh, sometimes it's, it's the pure legislative function, but, you know, I know that Congresswoman Jackson Lee and, and others in the CBC have been with us as we were fighting for voting rights, and, and some that were willing to get arrested with us and, and, and hold hands and, and block doors with us. Sometimes it takes that. Sometimes it takes um, taking the route that Cori Bush took when she sat on the, on the steps, or the route that John Lewis took when he sat in session. Um, on the on the floor of, of Congress. And so, you know, having folks who are willing to take that fight in all of its manifestations, that's important. And that's why we're so so proud to be able to work with folks like Sheila Jackson Lee and, and some other members that we know have been fighting the good fight, um, including H.R. 40 and reparations for a long time. Congresswoman, earlier. So, first, so as, 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 on that, what's the status of that? Well, well, let me, um, I'm going to come at that real big. 
I just want to comment on uh, both of these dynamic um, iconic. Can they hear me? Yeah, they got you. Dynamic icons that that put their hands in the bucket. You know, these are W. E. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington together. Booker T. Washington, put your bucket down. But they got their intellect with W. E. Du Bois. I, I want to emphasize it's layered. Uh, it is it is levels of energy and activism. We couldn't do it without them. But I need the folk that are out there talk. I want to answer the folk, and I want to answer the question about. It don't make me no never mind. I want to use that. Why am I voting again? I voted in 2020. Why am I voting again? There's something about continuity. I hate to say it. I wish voting and success on getting the job done was overnight. I want them to understand when Rosa sat down in about 1955 uh, on the bus, Dr. King didn't get the Voting Rights Act with all the foot soldiers and people who had died 1965. That's right. 1964 was the Civil Rights Act. And then we had long gaps. We had the Great Society. We pushed that. But there are long gaps because we keep going forward and keep going backwards. Don't give up on the vote because you've got to keep pushing the agenda. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't finish all the stuff the Congressional Black Caucus said, the American Rescue Act, uh, the uh, CARES Act. But the CHIPS Act, chaired by an African-American woman, Eddie Benice Johnson, the Science Committee, the CHIPS Act is when you folk couldn't get the chips for your phone. We are now giving uh, billions of dollars to create jobs, to create our own chip, bring that manufacturing back in. I'm setting up a center right here in the 18th Congressional District. Now, I want to be able to put a big sign. You did this. You voted, and right. that's how we got this, all right? Because a president was there to sign uh, a law that came about through the mm -hmm. energy of the Congressional Black Caucus. Let me also say to you, on the criminal justice end, we reduced your sentence, and we had the first step back. My good friend, Brother Jeffries, but then I had in the sentence of reduction. Well, well, I had to remind people, I had to, and again, this is where people get caught up. Uh, I had to remind people that, first of all, Trump didn't pass that. Please if remind it If it doesn't pass the House, ain't nothing for the Senate to vote on. And then even when it passed the House, it was Democrats in the Senate who said, no, nah, this ain't good enough, and they actually had to strengthen it. Then it was passed, and then it goes to his desk to sign. But a lot of folk... Act, act as if that didn't exist. Well, as they say, we hear the back story of that uh, uh, bill was that... Um, was well, Paul Harbour say the rest of the story. The rest of the story <laughs> is that he was hoping that was going to get him black votes, and he was very unhappy that it did not. Well, black people understand, uh, I think they understand who's in their best interest. But I, but, but I want to answer your question about H.R. 40. Uh, what this whole journey is about, I don't want people to say, well, i got to be in here for 50 years to get something done. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that you've got to be consistent and persistent and determined, and you can do so by making sure that you continue the journey. The journey was you had Joe Biden elected, and I didn't vote. I didn't vote. My vote wasn't the one that got him elected. It was all of everybody's vote that got him elected, and particularly the energy of African Americans. Go back to Georgia and everywhere else. Now you've got to continue the journey. Then you can look back and say, well, I didn't get anything. You've got to continue to get a Senate. You've got to continue to get a House in the hands of those who you think will listen to you. I always say, vote for the person that you can fuss at, and they'll call you back. Don't <laughs> vote for the person that you have to stand outside throwing a stone, and they don't even hear you. Right. Do that. And so H.R. 40 is on the verge. 217 co-sponsors. We got our challenges. We got our challenge in the Senate. We don't have enough folk in the Senate. But the point is, we can get a vote on the floor. You drop the numbers, and we don't keep the House and when I say that, when you say we, you know that I happen to be a Democrat. We don't keep the House because it was the Democrats who led it out of judiciary. Jerry Nell, Steve well, I, well, Jones, I, well, Jackson well, Congressman, I had to tell you this here because I've I had, I had a dude. And i got to tell him what H.R. 40 is before you do that. I've had dude, he, to study slavery and develop reparation proposals. No, it is not a study. The study part of it is a roadmap to then go to see what are the next steps on this whole issue of repair. And I hate people like, what is rep we'll never get it. The idea, it is an international legal theory that has been utilized around the world. It is not unfair to expect that African Americans can have systemic change. For example, your, your reparations could be never to see an HBCU closed. Uh, it could be dealing with the urban blight. It could be dealing with the fourth grade black students, male students that don't read it at fourth grade level. So, well, what you got? Some folks who say, "Well, Congressman, that ain't reparations." I mean, I mean, look, when I, I when I argued, I said, "If you reparations advocate, why aren't you fighting for Tennessee State to get the five hundred million dollars the state actually said they owed?" It was kind of like, "Oh, that ain't reparations." I'm it, like, it, "It's five hundred million. Yeah. What the hell are you talking about?" Or black farmers, where we 
it was our leadership that got right. black farms where they were, but they got sued. Right. And they held up in court. And still, in and that, still are. And, in that and give them their and right. give them their resolution to that. Uh, Cliff Latasha, I want y'all to speak to this here because you're out there on the ground. You're out there H. dealing R. with 40. people directly <laughs> on this here. You are coming face to face, knocking on doors, canvassing, and hearing the frustrations of people. Uh, how are you um, trying to get them beyond their frustrations? Because you can be frustrated and mad to say, I haven't seen this, 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 this. As the Congresswoman said, oh, reality is this here. Republicans take control of the House and or the Senate. There's a whole lot you're not going to see. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. Brother Cliff? Yeah, but I think there's, there's a couple of ways. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I think there's a couple of ways that we go at that, right? The, the first thing, very first thing, is that when folks express that frustration, the first thing that that I say and that we say as an organization is first that we 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 say we hear you, right? We affirm that some of the frustrations that they're feeling, that some of the things ha that have not gotten done, that that's real, right? That's an important thing. That's an important first step. Because sometimes people want you to engage in this discussion like like there has been no shortcomings, right? And and when you do that, you're not really coming from a space of authenticity, and that person that's resistant isn't any more likely to really hear you when you haven't affirmed that what they what their lived experiences and what they're seeing right in front of their eyes isn't like some mystical made up thing, but that is real. So the first thing to say is, you know what, there are some things that we didn't we didn't get the George Floyd Act, right? We haven't gotten voting rights. You you don't need to tell me about how frustrating it is that we didn't get voting rights, right? But but then let's talk about what we did get. And we go through the whole list of things, some of the which that you all talked about, the infrastructure and the, the, the HBCU funding and, and, and getting a Department of Justice. Be clear, we don't have the George Floyd Act, but you can't tell me it's irrelevant that we have a Department of Justice which has, has charged um, and found and, and, and indicted and, and got guilty verdicts on the, the police officers that killed Breonna Taylor. That's not inconsequential. It's not the, the systemic George Floyd Act. But that means something to send that message. And so we go through the list of things that we have got, and then folks start to say, okay, well, well, we have gotten a little bit, right? We have made some progress, some of which impacts us disproportionately. And then once you can get to that space, that, yeah, there's some stuff we didn't get, but, yeah, we did get some of the stuff that we wanted and that we were demanding, then you can make the case of you know how we get to the other stuff. We've got to have more power. We won some stuff in 20. We got some power in 20. We got some objectives and some tangibles met. And if we want to get to the rest, we got to have more power. And the only way for us to do that is for us to continue the trend of coming out in large, large numbers and overcoming the voter suppression that they're trying to throw at us. That's why our message is we won't black down. Latasha, take it. You know. You know, I am, I am ditto, ditto with everything that Brother Cliff has said. I will also say, you know, that I think what is important is for us to really recognize our community is at war. Like we can, we can, we can talk about kind of the, there's policy differences, but we're in a new era. This ain't a political era that we just talking about. There's these policy differences between two parties. There is one party that is in office right now that is fundamentally trying to kill us. Right. And that is not hyperbole, that when we're looking at the kind of policy, when we're looking at a party just on the refusal because a black man led it to, to expand health care, when we're seeing hospitals just like in Georgia, eight hospitals are closing. We're seeing millions of people in the South that desperately need health care, like not have access to health care. We're seeing governors and in a moment where we're hearing from people are saying that their electric bills, their utility bills are doubling or tripling, that they need fundamental help. And here you have a governor that is playing with the lives of people for his own political agenda. We see that with the Republican governor in Texas. We see it here in Georgia. We're seeing it in Mississippi with folks with their water. We're seeing it in Florida with DeSantis. It is a strategy for the Republicans to literally be able to use whatever they can to exploit the pain, to be able to use whatever it is that they can, and at the will, at the expense of even killing people, if it's about them advancing their agenda. And so I think we have to really recognize what's 
time it is. At this point, there has to be no space and no room for any party that coddles white supremacy. That at the end of the day, if you align yourself with those that are tr seeking to kill us, to actually undermine us, to destroy us, that there has to be zero tolerance. And so the reason why I'm saying that is because sometimes we create these false equivalencies. Yes, I am the first one to say that I have been a critic of both the Republican and the Democratic Party and will continue to be so when necessary, right? But at the end of the day, we're not going to act like it's a, we're talking about the same two things, right? We're literally talking about we're in a moment right now, not only that we're seeing voter suppression, we're in a moment when we're seeing millions of dollars, like I can take the state of Mississippi, millions of dollars that should have been gone to actually um, support a crumbling, uh, a crumbling system, a, a crumbling infrastructure system, millions of dollars of people who ne desperately needed support, TANF support around uh, food stamps and other assistance in one of the poorest states, that that money be used to a Republican cronies to actually be able to build a soccer field, a soccer stadium for his, for his daughter's school. That is what we're seeing, widespread fraud and corruption at the expense of literally black pain. And so we've got to really know what it is we're up against and what we're fighting. I think the other thing that is really important for people to understand, too, is that at the very least, we have to reduce the harm happening to our community. That when people come at us, we have to respond in a way that says, you're not going to come at us. You're not going to use us as fodder in your political game, and you don't have consequences. When you actually inflict consequences on people, they come a little bit different the next time. And part of what we have to really recognize is we have to be relentless. Those that seek to destroy us and to take away from us and really marginalize us in a particular place in the society, we have to be as relentless to push up against that. And then the last and the final thing that I say is for us, voting isn't about participation. It is about power. Who doesn't want power? It, it is in within our agency. If anybody is making a decision, I say this often, about me and my family, I should be a part of that decision-making process. The bottom line is whether you pol like politics or not, Every single aspect of your life is impacted by politics. You cannot go and get a job and it is not literally but some policy is actually framing that or managing that. You can't literally, you can't go buy a home. Every single aspect of our lives at this point is actually managed. In some way, it's in the context public policy touches that. And so since public policy is being made and is impacting us, then we have no choice but to engage in that process if we are to get anything that's not only going to reduce the harm, but anything that's going to help us advance to the kind of community, the things we need in our community that we desire and both that we deserve. Congress Bowen, final comment. Well, let me say that I have uh, soaked up both Cliff and Latasha, uh, power, agitation, avocation, and never giving up the fight. But it is matched by the legislative actions that come about in our halls of Congress and legislatures, council, seats, and otherwise. I need black folk to realize that they need to grab all of it, that they are as citizens of the United States and freed slaves, the descendants of those who put down, if you will, uh, their power in the soil as slaves, to be recognized, uh, to be rewarded, never, until this time, that they take their rightful place and never take a step back from both the participation and the power. Out of that comes results. And if you continue, then what we have not gotten, voting rights, and let me pay tribute to Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, as I said in the United States Supreme Court, where she gave a lesson to the other jurors, justices, to realize they have no out but to rule in favor of the plaintiffs in that Alabama case, which is to say that voting rights will be protected. But we're not finished. We need participation and power to get the Voting Rights Act passed, named the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Act, a CBC product out of Terry Sewell, uh, who comes out of Alabama. And then we did not get the law passed by legislature or legislation of the George, uh, Bra George Floyd um, uh, Justice Police and Justice Act but we got an executive order, but we're not finished because you have to get a law. And so why are we voting? You're voting so that you insist that there is a concrete voting rights law passed. You insist that we don't have to go hat in hand to the Supreme Court just to be able to vote. You insist that you can get a drink of water on a voting, on a voting line. You insist uh, that you have 
a overall police and justice act in the United States that covers Minnesota, Mississippi, New York, Texas, and beyond. And so the idea of this election here in Texas, I've got to mention Beto O'Rourke, compassionate, caring, listening. What do we have as a contrast? Don't think that doesn't touch your very pocketbook, your very home, your loved ones, uh, and your future. And if you understand that black folk drive the cultural engine of this nation and the moral engine of this nation, and so goes the nation, so goes African-Americans, so goes African-Americans, so goes the nation, embracing other people of color. I don't want anybody to say we've left anyone out. But the point is that as those who, how should I say it, built this nation on the very essence of cotton picking, they built this nation, they created Wall Street, the Commodities Exchange, they built the White House, they built the United States Capitol, their time is due. Their time is now. And that item that you use, along with agitation, right now we're having a trial, the first trial of a black woman in Houston shot by a officer while she was in a mental health crisis, shot dead, point blank, not in the back, looking straight at her. You need to be in the mix to ensure that policing changes, that education changes, that the economic infrastructure changes, that banks change, that access to capital change, that small businesses change. How do you do that? You continue the journey. And you fight for H.R. 40. I need everybody fighting for H.R. 40. I'm determined for it not to be seen as something that will never come or that we don't need. You absolutely do need. Did you work over 200 years without compensation, without life insurance, uh, without any kind of acknowledgement? Uh, do you see disparities across America in our community? Yes, in 2022. And what we hope with a reparations construct, Tennessee would get their money. Black farmers would get their money. But also systems would change in policing and education in, in HBCU. So I finish on this note. It is a combination. It is not all one. It is not all, all those elected officials, all those public servants. I don't hear anything from them. It is getting there and insisting that they do. It is getting there and being heard. And it's agitation when needed. And as my brother and sister said, it is power. It is standing up when needed. It is taking a stand and never falling. And for, how should I say, for God's sakes, black folk, let's be united. We are all different. We are in different regions. But there's nothing stronger than the fists. Fingers on the hand kind of weak, but you put the hand together and you make us as strong as we possibly can. We don't have to launch out at somebody else. We can just be strong on our agenda, our power, and the children that come behind us, we will have to be able to say, they never gave up on me. And John Lewis said, they never gave out, they never gave in, they never gave up. That's what I think this election should be. Don't give up, don't give out, and don't give in get to the polls and vote, and then demand your rightful place when those who are elected are your choice and they keep the House, the Senate, the governorships change in Georgia and Texas. What a miracle that will be. And then let's hold everybody accountable. I'm ready to own up. I'm ready to be accountable. Hold me up because I'm going to fight like heck for folk because their vote counts. All right, and somebody on YouTube said we should have an usher down front. All right, Congresswoman yeah. Hugh Jackson Lee, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Latasha and Cliff, uh, thanks a bunch. I appreciate uh, always uh, y'all supporting us at Black Star Network, uh, partnering with this here. And so we certainly uh, won't, be, won't, won't, won't be the last. Oh, yeah, they can, they can see. They can see. Won't, won't, won't be the last time. Uh, all right, hey, hey, Henry, switch the shot. Congresswoman, want to throw them a power, power fist. Uh, so, uh, so we appreciate it. Latasha, Cliff, thanks a lot. Thank you. Vote, 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 Coming, vote, coming up next, vote, Reese vote, Monique, but also Beto O'Rourke on Roller Martin on the on the Black Star Network back in a moment. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe. We all shine. 
Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood-Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Libraries empower the community with education. Liberia Economic Development Initiative, LEDI, is hosting the International Life Changers Awards and Liberia's Bicentennial to celebrate LEDI building the country's first modern public library and technology center. Join event host Roland Martin, our honorees, Reverend Dr. Jamal Bryant, Zernona Clayton, Thomas Dorch Jr., Dana Lupton, Dr. Tammy Graysteel on October 29th at the CNN Center Atlanta. There are no public libraries in Liberia, but together we can change that. Get tickets at ledinow.org. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. I'm Angie Stone. Hi, I'm Teresa Griffin. Oh, Roland. <laughs> hey, Roland. I am so disappointed that you are not here, first of all. Um, where's our dance? It's like we get a dance in every time I see you. And so now you're not here for me to dance with, sir. You and your ascot. I need it. I need that in my life right now. Okay. Um, I love you, Roland. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network live from Texas Southern University in H-Town. Joining us right now, folks, is Beto O'Rourke, who's Democratic nominee for governor of the state of Texas. Uh, and if I had to be a bet man without seeing him yet, Beto, what, you got a blue shirt on? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? It's really good. We are in South Oak Cliff here in Dallas, about to go to a high school football game. It's Friday night, and you know as a native Texan, a Houstonian, um, someone who is at A&M, this is part of the religion and culture of this state. So we're going to be there with people that we want to serve, get a chance to watch a great game, and continue this campaign 32 days out. And I feel really good about where we are and what we're going to do on November 8th. Uh, you have been, uh, I saw uh, some of the debate with uh, Governor Greg Abbott. Uh, I must say, as somebody who is still registered in Dallas County, uh, I thought it was really trash to have a debate and literally say, don't invite anyone into the audience. What's the whole point of having a thousand seat auditorium? Uh, I don't understand. He's been governor for several years. Why are you scared to have people show up at a debate? It just made no sense to me. He hasn't had one public event this entire year where any of his constituents who support him, oppose him, 
who just want to make sure that they can meet him or hold him accountable have been able to attend. I think you used the best word. He's he's scared of them. He's been governor for eight years. His party controls every position of power statewide in the legislature, appointments, committees, and commissions. And I think his fear is based on the fact that he has so badly failed the state. The grid went out on his watch. It's still not fixed. The most extreme abortion ban in America without exception for rape or incest. Gun violence now the leading cause of death for kids and teenagers. And it's been 19 weeks, Roland, since Uvalde, and he hasn't done a thing to make it any less likely that that happens in any other classroom and in any other community in this state. So doesn't have much to run on or to say, is going to have a hard time defending that record. He's thinking that if he just hides in a bunker, he's going to be able to skate through or at least squeak by. But we're out here with the people, including those who don't always agree with us and bringing them in. We were at your alma mater at a and last week, had a huge turnout, filled an 800-person theater, and then there were hundreds of young people outside who could not get in. As you probably know, they moved, they removed the polling location from a and because he is so afraid yep. of those students voting in this election. And they lie. They actually say it's because of low turnout. Uh, anybody knows that is one of the highest voter turnout locations in Brazos County. That's just a flat out lie. Absolutely. It's the same thing that they tried to do at just, Prairie View, a and at TSU. I mean, th this is across the state, wherever young people are, because he knows that they will be the margin of victory in this election. And he's trying to keep them from voting. This election, and he's trying to keep them from voting. Um, a lot of people criticized you and Uvalde when you challenged him and others at the news conference. Well, today, uh, the entire Uvalde police force of the school district has been suspended. Well, this news, in, the Uvalde superintendent is announcing his retirement. All of that pressure from parents and others uh, to demand reform is actually happening. Uh, and so what, what you have been advocating is that part of that reform are, is removing the folks in Austin who also have not responded to the needs of the people to do something about guns in this country and keeping our kids safe. That's right. And, you know, it's interesting, Roland, uh, a couple of weeks ago in answering Gromer Jeffers and Julie Fine's questions on their political television show in Dallas, the governor about Uvalde said there should be accountability up and down the ballot. Now, I think he meant to say something else, but that's what came out, and he could not be more right. That accountability cannot just stop at the school district police force. It has to include the governor. There, there were 91 Texas Department of Public Safety troopers in that community on the other side of an unlocked door, some there for more than 70 minutes, who never went in, never did their job. And I think there are some, some token firings here and there. But until we know the full truth, there will not be accountability. There will not be justice. And that's what those parents and families in Uvalde expect. They're fighting for. They deserve it. Our victory will ensure that they get it, in addition to the action that we need to take to reduce the likelihood that that ever happens again to another community in any other part of this state. Look, when you look at the polls, you are you have closed the gap, but there's still more work to be done there. Uh, and the thing that jumps out for me, to be to, to be honest, uh, is that there are people in this state who believe, look, at the end of the day, look, Republicans are going to keep controlling this. And so, um, you know, what are you saying to the people who are doubting that Texas can actually uh, put back put a Democrat back in the governor's mansion. You know how you know how do you reach these Republicans, these conservatives in this state who are freezing? Some who died uh, when we had uh, the, uh, the the winter storm because of the Texas grid, and then the governor, frankly, allowed those those electric companies to keep charging folks uh, high rates, and still the grid has not been fixed. What are you saying to them to get through? Folks, uh, I guess using Donald Trump, what he said to black people, what, what the hell you got to lose? You're absolutely right. You look at the higher utility bills that we are now paying because of Greg Abbott, 45 bucks more per rate payer on average, the $20 billion increase in property taxes, 
Roland, today in Texas, on average, we are paying more in taxes than people are in California. And you know, it used to be the other way around, and there was this whole idea that there was tax flight from California to Texas. It may now start moving in the other direction. He's a single greatest driver of inflation in the state, and his extremism, whether on abortion, on guns, on CRT, and trying to scare people about our own history and drive even more teachers out of the classroom. It is making us less competitive for business, for capital, for talent, and we're gonna have our lunch eaten by other states and other countries. But there's this also, you know, beyond the disaffected Republican and independent, who I know we can bring over, especially after I saw the focus group results following the debate last Friday, as you know, because you've been very powerful and eloquent on this, there are millions of functionally disenfranchised voters in Texas. More polling places closed in this state than in any other. That six-hour line that we'll see on Election Day just outside of TSU, it's not just that people are so hungry to vote. It's that the polling places have been closed in other parts of that neighborhood, forcing the indignity upon our fellow Texans of a six-hour wait. And for everyone who can wait six hours to vote, we know there are a lot who are working too hard or raising their kids or taking care of their folks or just say, the hell with that. I'm not doing that in my own democracy. So he, he is literally, to your point earlier about being scared of his own constituents and voters, he's trying to keep the people out who can spell the end of his career. So my job to answer your question about these polls in these 32 days is to use the 95,000 volunteers who signed up in this campaign to be on the doors of those who've been drawn out of this democracy, give them a reason and an opportunity to vote and make sure that they become the margin of victory when we win this on November 8th. And that will be some pretty powerful, profound, poetic political justice when we do. And it will be those who were not supposed to participate who bring it home at the end of the day. Well, uh, look, uh, a lot of times they'll say, well, as journalists, we cannot uh, get involved in certain things. I tell folks, well, I'm a journalist, but also I own my company, so I can do what the hell I want to do. Um, I've got 13 nieces and nephews, and so uh, this election is about their future as well. So uh, whatever you need me to do, let me know, uh, because I may, I've been clear. I tweeted Abbott and Dan Patrick directly. They are horrible for this state. Uh, and frankly, it's time for them to go. And we certainly need someone like you in that governor's mansion. And so we appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, let me know if I need to come back to Texas uh, to do something, because uh, we, we, we've got to get those folks to understand that those disaffected voters can actually be the difference if they use their power. Absolutely. And we'll take you up on it. And I'm grateful for it. It means the world to us. Um, wish you much success in the rest of your stay here. And yes, over the next 32 days, let's find a way to get you back. Let's find a way to get you back. All right. Sounds great. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Adios. Adios. I'm going to now go to uh, Reese Cover, Black Women, founder of Black Women Views, Monique Presley, uh, of course, uh, lawyer. Uh, also, uh, of course, was a planner of all of this, uh, sending me all these text messages. You got to come. You got to come. Calm down. You got to come. I'm like, Laura, she was like just bugging the hell out of her brother. So we're here. Glad to have both of y'all here. I want to pick up on what he, the, the end there. That, that really is the key. Reverend, Reverend Barber talks about this here. 140 million poor people in this country, low-income poor people, and really the largest voting by other people who don't vote. Uh, and it's just getting them, Reese, to understand, y'all, you can flip elections. Biden wins Georgia by 11,000 votes. Obama wins North Carolina in 2008 by 14,100 votes. Sherry Beasley loses at the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in North Carolina in 2020 by 400 votes. Uh, Sabrina Fulton, when she ran for um, uh, a commissioner there in the Miami area, lost by less than uh, 200 votes. And so uh, if it's just a matter of getting folks to understand you can do something, but you got to do it. That's the thing. I don't know if it's just on. Uh, first, shout out to Monique. Make it make sense. Um, and thank you, Roland, for having me here for two days. Um, no, absolutely. You know, I think so much of what we're seeing is people voting defensively when it comes to immigration. You can pay millions of dollars, billions of dollars for these stunts, and people are with it because they feel like immigrants are taking their jobs. Whereas you have somebody like Beto who's running to expand Medicaid. That's something that affects 1.4 million Texans. 
You have a teacher shortage. He's running to recruit more teachers. He's running to lower taxes. Greg Abbott is actually trying to um, implement uh, increased sales taxes. That's a sales tax on working people and people who don't have property. And so there are a lot of affirmative reasons to vote for Beto, and there are a lot of defensive reasons to vote against Greg Abbott. But people have to understand the tangible things that are at stake in this election. And this might be one of the last times that we even have the ability to influence elections, because if the Republicans have their way, you have the Secretary of State, you have the Attorney General who's running from the, uh, the, the, the people trying to serve subpoenas. Okay, what's that about? And you have Greg Abbott. Who's also under federal investigation, let's be oh, real clear. Oh, yes, hello, hello. Law and order, so much for that. So you have these Republicans who are hell-bent on making sure that they hold on to power come hell or high water. And so not just in Texas, but around the country, this is one of our greatest stands that we can take in 2008. And it costs you nothing. It costs you time, but right. it's not something you have to pay for in, in right. monetarily. Uh, I want to go to that point, uh, uh, hold on to power. Dana Lash, uh, conservative, uh, called um, one uh, call one of the women who is the mother of Herschel Walker's child a skank. <laughs> Ooh, no uh, skank. Call her a skank uh, because she talked about having an abortion. But here's what she said. She said, I don't care. Mm -hmm. We want that seat. And, and, and what I keep trying to explain, and I do it constantly, trying to explain to people, they understand power. Look, Chris Christie was really pissed at me when I jammed them up on ABC this week a year ago when I said, you cared about power. Not party, yes, see, power and party. Not principles, not values, not morals, not character. Power. And I think for many Democrats and progressives, it's how does someone make me feel? I want to feel good. I need, I, need to, I need to believe in them. Most of these Republicans, they actually hate Donald Trump. <laughs> Talk to them privately. And I know you listen in on one conversation. I didn't forget. When they were trashing him, two of his biggest defenders, trashing big time. Oh, they, 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 they hate him privately. But it's about power. And, I, and, and people have to understand that's what this is about. Power. Money. Yes, that is what it's about. Um, but to your point, getting us to know that it's possible for us to have it, uh, to access it, to utilize it, and that one of the ways that we can do that is through the vote. Those are the steps. And when uh, we have been for generations marginalized, uh, and when we have been imprisoned, not just um, through chains or through shackles, but then later through finance, then later through health, and then, then it ends up where it's in your mind. Uh, they talk in psychology about the fact that the vestige of slavery are not just in our finances, it's running through our DNA. It affects the manner in which we think about ourselves. I know that's in H.R. 40 because my congressman right here will tell you that part of what they're trying to do with the legislation is get us the mental health that we need. So if that's where we are and if that's what we're facing, then it is it's stuff like this that shows us if you vote and you take your vote seriously, and you are an engaged citizen, that we can make a difference. We can make change. Listen, I am home. I am Texas. Yes, I am serious about this. Yes, I bothered you. I bothered Congresswoman. I bothered Reese. I bothered Lurie. I bothered Beto. Thank you, Aisha McClendon, senior advisor to, to Beto O'Rourke for ensuring. Thank you, Jason Lee, deputy campaign manager, for making sure that that happened today. I appreciate y'all. But the reason is, when I was 12 years old, the first p political campaign I ever worked on, was putting signs in my neighbor's yard when Ann Richards was running for treasurer in this state. And she was the first woman to hold a statewide office in 50 years. Now, there are people who are living now and live in Texas and don't even know that we were ever blue. All blue. And, and all, all blue. of all of my childhood, we were blue. So I was with Ann when Ann was commissioner. I was putting signs in at 12 years old for a 1983 race when she became treasurer. I watched her become governor, and now her daughter has, has, has run nationwide organizations. Listen, we the same legacy that enables Reese to sit here, the same legacy of this building that is named after Barbara Jordan and Mickey Leland for the seat that our esteemed congresswoman is sitting right here holding, that legacy is in the vote. 
It's in the vote. And so for me, I, I believe that if there's any single person, we can convince um, that it is worth it to stand. And if we have organizations like Black Voters Matter who will show up for black media, show up uh, for voters and give us comfort food, if, the t if, if they let us, um, will get on a bus and go across the nation, uh, then I think that that is work well done. So I thank you, Roland, for letting us be here today and do it. You use the word tan. Uh, Reese, and I hear all these folk out here yelling, hollering, screaming, tangibles. And when I was on The Breakfast Club, uh, the, uh, we recorded the interview on Tuesday. It ran today. Uh, and I had to walk folk through that. And I said, first of all, to all of these simple Simons out there who are yelling tangibles, first of all, a candidate can only make a promise. Mm -hmm. This is what I will do to fight for this if you elect me. Right. But then, if they win, it's now called math. Mm. So for all the folk who are hollering about reparations, you need 218 votes in the House for it to pass. Not 210, not 195, mm -hmm. 218. Now, if it's another issue on a school board, Let's say you got nine school board members. You elect one. You need four more votes. It's math. It's math. It's math. It's you, math. Need, you need majority. Yeah. City council, you need majority. And so you can say, I'm demanding this. A person can promise it, mm -hmm. but they have to first get elected, which means that it's kind of stupid to say, I demand tangibles, but I'm not going to vote. Unless I get tangibles. I, you, you, you can't get it if you don't mo right the math ain't mathing but then after the election is over there's some work that you have to do because they can't do it by themselves when you have other people we're seeing in the united states senate people suppose like we need this this, this. it's 50 50. Mm -hmm. one person can go no and it's that's the reality and so that to me is what is crazy when i hear these people who have no understanding of politics who just Frankly, they're just whining and complaining. And so I tell people, you want tangibles, you have to ensure the person is elected, which means you kind of got to vote. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the craziest things I hear people say is, we've been giving Democrats our votes all these years. What have we got from Democrats? Okay, but let's, let's talk about your particular state. Because in your state, who has the power? Is it the Democrats that have the power or is it the Republicans that have the power? In Texas, Republicans have the power. They have the trifecta. Beto would be a defensive mechanism. He would be an offensive mechanism. In Florida, DeSantis is basically an autocrat down there. He has oh, a Supreme Court. He has a legislature. In, in, uh, in um, Georgia, Kemp has the power. Republicans have the power. In Wisconsin, Republicans have the power because they've gerrymandered the thing to hell. And Tony Evers is playing defense on there. And uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, Republicans have the power in legislature, but the, the the Democrat is in the governorship. And, and attorney general. And attorney. Hello. So when you talk about what our votes are getting, hey, we need to keep voting. But also recognize that sometimes our votes alone don't do it because you have to win, okay? And so we can vote for the Democrats if they're not the ones in power. And, and they're holding the wrong people accountable. And even if you're, the Democrat doesn't win... You got to give the Republican hell who is in office because you're still a constituent. Exactly. You can't say, oh, well, I ain't going to say nothing for four years. No, we got to be showing up right on the, and that behind. That's why I want to talk about Tennessee. Mm -hmm. They control the legislature. Their own committee says Tennessee state has been sh shorted $500 million. But then you have these weak folk. And, Norm, you know, and I don't, well, I ain't even going to say his name, but, but he's ridiculous. They took offense when I said, where y'all FBA, B1, ADOS people? Why, where, where's your rally mm -hmm. fight for Tennessee State? Right. And uh, oh, oh, well, that ain't reparations. Oh, but you couldn't even figure out how to get a permit in Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's petty. You couldn't even figure that out, and it's not hard, okay? But y'all don't want to say nothing about getting Tennessee State $500 million, but y'all claim y'all love black people, and y'all claim y'all want black people to get stuff. That's what I'm talking about there. It's like, yo, understand, that's a perfect example, we should be applying pressure to Republicans of Tennessee, where's the money? Just like 
fools we applied to Democrats in Maryland. Mm -hmm. The governor was holding it up, yeah. but you had some Republican Democrats, governor. Republican governor, but you had some Democrats in the legislature who didn't make it a priority mm -hmm. until the Black Caucus said, you know what, ain't nothing moving mm -hmm. till we approve this settlement. Mm -hmm. That's how the four HBCUs got the $577 million settlement. And so it's getting people to understand that even if our person we want not there, yeah. You still give him hell. Yeah. We should be rolling up in Austin, mm -hmm. telling Abbott, Dan Patrick. Dan Patrick, when he's speaking around Houston, yeah, all y'all folk roll up on him and say, oh, we still constituents. Mm -hmm. You represent us because what they've done is they've said, oh, black people, we don't care about y'all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're going to govern for these people over here. That's also how we got to be challenging folks. And can I just say one more thing on this topic because, you know, we have um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee here. There's so much more smoke for her and the CBC on. on the issue of reparations. I've looked at the social media traffic. Who? Where's the ad towards Rand Paul? Where's the ad towards Mitch McConnell? Where's the ads towards Kevin McCarthy? They aren't there. Where's the ads towards Herschel Walker, who said that reparations is basically a sin? But all these people, oh, we're going to vote for Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker will won't. Oh, no, I had uh -oh. one dude who tweeted me. He said, uh... I, I'm voting for Kemp and Walker until we get reparations. And I went. <laughs> I said, can you please show me an example where either one has actually supported the issue? Hmm. And, then I had, and then I had this other dude who was like, Roland, all you do is shield for these Democrats. Uh, cut the check. And I resp responded. I said, can you please show me one Republican in Congress mm -hmm. who supports your initiative. I said, so now, I said, so, I'm saying, now I'm confused. So you're trashing Democrats who is your only pathway to the money. Right. I said, I'm just saying that's kind of dumb. I said, now, if you're opposing a Democrat who doesn't support it, that's different. I said, but you literally are trashing the very people who are advancing it and then I get this one. Well, HR 40, that ain't nothing this week. Okay, so p please show me what's your option. See, that's the other deal. I, I just fundamentally believe that, the, the, that a number of these folks are uh, agents. Oh, yeah, 100%. Trolls. Mm -hmm. uh, they hate anything and everything. And all they actually are about are clicks mm -hmm. and grifting mm. and attention. And, and feel free for y'all to make more videos about me because my audience is bigger than yours anyway. <laughs> and y'all combined. <laughs> so, the, go ahead. There's a, but the issue is the perception about the vote, right? There you go. Because what you're saying is they're, they're saying, well, I'm not going to vote for them. I'm going to vote for Kemp and I'm going to vote for this one. As if Stacy is the one who's not going to be okay mm -hmm. if she doesn't become governor. As if, if, if Joe Biden is no longer president of the United States, he's going to be on the struggle bus. As if the VP, if we don't support the VP, won't be able to feed her family. They're looking at their vote as if it is something that is doing someone else a favor, not as an, a control point, an access to power where you place a demand for the things that you want. If President Biden doesn't remain president, it hurts my family, not his. I mean, nobody wants any of those other options, but I've got, I've got young children. You know, I've got, I've got teens. I, I want my grandchildren to be okay. So when I'm voting, I'm not thinking about doing President Biden a favor by giving him four more years in the White House. I'm thinking about doing my children a favor by giving them an opportunity at clean air. Yep. I'm, so so I, I would encourage people to think about your vote as an access point, your vo vote as power, and your vote as as money. It's like sitting at the table and saying, I don't, I don't eat broccoli. I don't eat broccoli. I don't eat broccoli. But you're willing to vote for somebody who's only going to feed you broccoli. And they're going to keep feeding it to you until you either starve and die or until you decide you like it. And so what we're seeing right now in the Adolf land is people who've decided they liked it. And that's as far oh, well, as I'm going to go. I, 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 I hate broccoli. Give me cabbage. All right. Um, uh, th th that is it for us. First of all, um, when is the voter registration deadline in Texas? 
Tuesday. It is this Tuesday, the 11th of October, and you can not vote on register to vote online. You cannot postmark it a day later. You have to have it either in a voter registration box or you have to have it in a mailbox postmarked for the 11th. So please, and it requires you to know your county when you put it on there. So you can go to vote.org or you can go to the links at, at Black Voters Matter Fund. Um, dot org in order to figure out your county and then figure out how to download the form. You can actually, if you go to vote.org, fill out the form online and then print it. Then all you got to do is manage a stamp. But the last day to register for this election for November 8th is on the 11th. Can I please thank some vendors? Do we have to do that? Thank you, Lamont Kitchen, for the food that we are all about to eat. We appreciate you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, who's that? Oh, Lamont Kitchen, owned by Reginald Martin. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> brother, I'm, of I'm the saying host. my grandmother found the business. I'm, I'm just saying you might want to add that. Yeah, um, I'm just saying. Yes, Lamont is a family name. Thank you, Rob G, the general for uh, DJing. Thank you to uh, Greenleaf, um, which is. Uh, I don't know if I can say what kind of dispensary it is, but they made a considerable, <laughs> it's legal, they made a considerable donation. We appreciate them. Uh, thank you to Reese Lurie, to every guest who was on here, to Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, Beto, er, Jesus, everybody. I appreciate y'all. Okay. All right, then. So, folks, uh, that is it for us. Again, we want to appreciate Black Voters Matter. We want to appreciate the Congresswoman, Beto, everybody else who participated. We want to thank uh, the law students here as well. Uh, and want to thank uh, folks for coming out. Uh, young brother right here walked in. He's like, my mama watch your show every day. <laughs> See? That's why I keep telling y'all. See, when mamas and daddies watch, they make their kids watch. That's how the kids get informed. See? Y'all can't be sending y'all kids out the room. Oh, I'm All right. sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Texas Southern University, Dean Douglas, the School of Public Affairs, and the, the law school for enabling us to come into this wonderful establishment to do this show and being so helpful. I appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, folks, again, deadline is Tuesday. And so we're going to be giving you the deadlines. Uh, so, Kara, make a note of all the states, when the deadlines are. Then also, we're going to start driving people when it comes to early voting. Uh, uh, East St. Louis, NAACP, I will see y'all on Sunday. I will be there on Sunday. Sunday, uh, speaking at your Freedom Fund uh, banquet, Morehouse. I'll see y'all on Tuesday uh, in Atlanta with my man, uh, my frat brother, Dr. Walter Kimbrough. Uh, I'll be back in uh, Georgia uh, for October 17th. Uh, that's when early voting begins there for the Abrams campaign and the Warnock campaign. Uh, and so, uh, look, we're going to be on the road a whole lot uh, in uh, October. Dates are filling up fast. And I've got, uh, I think, Sherry Beasley's folks are trying to get me to go to North Carolina. And so we'll see uh, what happens there. There. So, folks, again, uh, it's all important. I keep telling y'all, stop listening to folk who are feeding you mess, different disinformation, and misinformation. Uh, we are about facts and truth, and we are about advancing black power. I ain't got a problem saying it, okay? I'll, so that's how we do it here. And so please, support us in what we do. So first, download the Black Star Network app, okay? Download it on every device that you have, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And in about three weeks, our 24-hour streaming channel will be live. Uh, and Amazon's the first one. They, they, they wanted us bad, so we're going to be launching that. And on the election night, November 8th, we're going to have uh, a minimum of six hours of live coverage that night. So that's what you can do when you own it. So y'all ain't got to waste your time going to CNN, MSNBC. You are guaranteed to see black people on election night on my show. Uh, support, our, support our Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, check in money orders. Go to P.O. Box uh, 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rolling at smartin.com. Rolling at rolling at unfiltered.com. Uh, and, of course, you can also get your copy of White Fear, how the Brownie of America is making white folks lose their minds. Uh, get it up all, all bookstores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, Books a Million Target. Also, order from your favorite black bookstore. And, of course, you can also download it on Audible as well. And so if y'all get it, have it with you. You see me in airports like the other day, trust me, I'll go ahead and sign the book while you're there. And let me shout out last night. We were in Swainsboro, Georgia, two and a half hours uh, from uh, Atlanta. And a uh, shout out to Daphne Moses. Daphne was like, uh, she's like, look, I ain't doing no cash app. I ain't sending no money order. She walked up and gave me her money. And so, Daphne, I appreciate that. Thank you so very much. 
much. We end the show every Friday, of course, uh, running a list of names of people who support the show. Thank you so very much. And again, thank the folks at TSU. Always good to be back home uh, here in the Trey Third Ward. All right, folks, I will see y'all on Monday. Where will I be? I'll be back in D.C., but I'll see you in Atlanta on Tuesday. We out. Ho! Thank mm-hmm. you.